audio jungle. Tonight, the promising news from Pfizer in the fight against Omicron. The company announcing clinical trials have begun for a vaccine specifically targeting the Omicron variant, when it could be available. Also, news on President Biden's vaccine mandate for large businesses after the Supreme Court blocked it. And on the front lines with EMS workers, the burnout they're facing heading into year three of the pandemic. Also tonight, with U.S. troops on heightened alert, President Biden warning Russia will face enormous consequences if it invades Ukraine. And what he said about sanctioning Vladimir Putin personally. New images, U.S. weapons arriving in the Ukraine as Russia makes a major show of force. Days after that shooting ambush in New York, a second NYPD officer dying after his rookie partner was killed. The new supply chain warning, the shortage on one critical item that could drive prices up even further. Just 10 days until the Winter Olympics kick off, the extreme measures Beijing is taking to crack down on COVID for the games. And the big changes coming to the SAT. This is NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good evening. In the constant chase to get ahead of COVID-19, a new Omicron-specific vaccine is about to enter testing. But in a measure of just how quickly this pandemic is evolving, the question being asked, will we need it by the time it's ready? The modified vaccine by Pfizer perhaps months away as new COVID cases continue to drop, still leaving overwhelmed hospitals, which are now finding some antibody treatments against Omicron, are not working. Also today, the Biden administration is pulling its rule that employees at large companies either be vaccinated or regularly tested. As now two years into the pandemic, mask rules continue to generate heat. Miguel Almaguer starts our coverage. Announcing the start of their new clinical trial today, Pfizer says it's testing if their new reformulated COVID vaccine will specifically target the Omicron variant and to see how effective that new formula would be. With the vaccinated and boosted already highly protected against hospitalization, the FDA would then have to consider if the formula is even needed. In a trial expected to take months, it comes as pockets of the nation emerge beyond Omicron's peak. How difficult is it to get ahead of a new variant with a vaccine? If a new variant emerges, um, we can always build vaccines, but they can take several months to build and test. Vaccines always play a really important role, but often not fast enough to deal with a new variant. With Omicron still fueling a pandemic record of ER visits, today the CDC confirmed the disease severity appears to be lower than previous peaks, but medical centers remain overwhelmed with the sheer volume of those sick. And now the FDA says two monoclonal antibodies by Regeneron and Eli Lilly can no longer be used after proving to be ineffective against Omicron, which accounts for 99.5%. 0.9% of infections. Where the virus changes, we have to change our tools. Some of the old tools will work. Sometimes you have to build new ones. As new infections this month alone total nearly half as many cases as all of last year, the virus is still evolving faster than our tools against it. I don't think there's a chance that we're going to eradicate this. We've only done that with one virus and that's been smallpox. Tonight, a nation exhausted of COVID, still paying the pandemic's price. Miguel, circling back to the Biden administration, why are they reversing course on the vaccine or test mandate for large employers? Well, Lester, the change followed the Supreme Court's decision to block the rule earlier this month. Many large businesses, including Starbucks, for example, also dropped their vaccine mandate after the Supreme Court decision. Meanwhile, the debate over masks in several states continues to play out in courtrooms across the country. Lester. Miguel Almaguer starting us off. Thank you. This latest COVID wave is putting enormous stress on frontline health workers. Jacob Soboroth rode along today with one EMS team in Northern California that is facing constant calls, delays, 
and burnout. In California's capital, the first responders citizens turn to for help are now saying they need it too. We're with Sacramento Metro Fire and we're on our way to a call for a 34-year-old that's supposedly coughing up blood. Once these EMTs get there, they're able to treat this patient. And there's no guarantee that patient's going to be able to get into the hospital. We pulled up to find a patient having a medical episode that wasn't life-threatening. Captain Parker Wilburn is with Sacramento Metro Fire. What would seem to be an emergency for them is obviously not an emergency to us. Essentially, all we're going to be doing is giving him a ride to the hospital. And you think he's going to get in right away when he shows up? Absolutely not. No? No, we're going to be, this ambulance will then be out of service for at least one hour. Hospital delays aren't new, but the Omicron wave crippling staff shortages and an extremely high volume of non-emergency 911 calls has made it worse. Wilburn says in the county, ambulance turnaround times that should be 15 minutes averaged over an hour last month. They're sitting inside the hallway of the hospital. We call it wall time because they're sitting on the wall waiting for a bed. Soon, another call comes through. We've got a rollover vehicle accident. We head out to meet a team from another station. And this is horrific. She doesn't look like she has life-threatening injuries. Is there any guarantee she's going to be seen right away if she goes to the hospital? There's no guarantee she's going to be seen right away. How much of it is COVID? COVID's brought a light to an issue that was already here. For EMTs, stress exacerbated by a pandemic may now outlive it. How much longer can you all keep going like this? I'm really unsure. People are overworked. Um, we're working as much as we can. It's, I don't know how much longer we can do it. Under pressure and unsure when relief will come. Jeez. Jacob Soboroff, NBC News, Sacramento. And you can see much more of Jacob's report tonight on Top Story on News Now. With weapons and words, the United States and NATO allies are sending Russia a powerful new message tonight to stay out of Ukraine. President Biden warning of enormous consequences if Russia invades. Richard Engel is in Ukraine tonight. With diplomacy failing, NATO and Russia are both mobilizing for a potential war. Tonight, more American weapons, part of a $200 million, 90-ton package, arrived in Ukraine to help defend against a possible Russian invasion. President Biden saying he's close to deciding whether to mobilize additional U.S. troops already on high alert to Eastern Europe, although not inside Ukraine. Oh, lead to that. What would lead to that is what's going to happen, what Putin does or doesn't do. And uh, I may be moving some of those troops in the nearer term just because it takes time. And saying he might sanction President Putin himself if he invades. If he were to move in with all those forces, it would be the largest invasion since World War II. It would change the world. NATO allies big and small are also moving east. Spain deploying fighter jets to Bulgaria and warships to the Black Sea. Denmark sending jets to Lithuania and France vowing to defend Romania. All of Eastern Europe is a potential front, while Russia denies it will invade with new military drills today. It keeps the world guessing. Ukraine's president is telling people to remain calm and that he's seeking a diplomatic solution. But here in the East, some volunteers are already signing up in case they need to fight. Lester. Richard England, Ukraine, thank you. Back home, a second NYPD officer has died days after a shooting left him with critical injuries. 27-year-old Wilbert Morrow was wounded on Friday when a gunman opened fire during a domestic call. Morrow's 22-year-old rookie partner, Jason Rivera, was also killed. The suspected gunman was wounded at the scene and died on Monday. A new warning from the government tonight that the global shortage of computer chips is slowing the economy and could force some factories to close. So the supply chain crisis, shortages and inflation could get worse. Here's Tom Costello. 
It's not just cell phones and computers. Microchips today are critical components in an endless list of products. TVs, refrigerators, power and communication systems, aviation, toys, cars, trucks, the list goes on. But the Commerce Department reports many U.S. companies had just a five-day supply of chips on hand late last year, down from a typical 40-day supply. And 80% of computer chips are made in Asia. Today, our semiconductor supply chain is far too dependent on conditions in countries halfway around the world. But tonight, critical Chinese manufacturing hubs and ports are slowed, shut down, or gridlocked as China tries to contain Omicron. And that means higher prices in the U.S. New cars already up 15 percent, expected to climb even more. Clothing expected to jump 3 to 10 percent. Furniture by 10 percent. Electronics by 10 percent or more. In New Jersey, Pish Posh Baby is struggling to get everything from strollers to high chairs. We're really concerned that inventory is not going to get out quick enough before Chinese New Year, as well as slow down production that we desperately need uh, for spring. China alone is responsible for a third of the world's manufacturing. It used to take ships 50 days to reach the U.S. Now it's taking 110 days. We don't see any signs of things getting better. If anything, it's getting a bit worse. We haven't had any let up in Americans' preference for consuming goods. Experts say the world's manufacturers are still struggling to keep up with U.S. demand, sending prices soaring. Until that consumer demand slows, prices are unlikely to come back down. Lester? Tom Costello, thank you. In just 60 seconds, the big news about the SATs, what students and parents need to know. The pencils, the erasers, the anxiety. At least the first two will become things of the past for the SATs. The College Board announcing today the tests will go digital as a growing number of colleges do away with them. Here's Rahima Ellis. It's the test that looms so large for millions of high school students like Natalia Cossio. Oh yeah, I definitely felt a lot of pressure taking the SATs. Now the SAT will move from pencil and paper to digital. Today the College Board, which administers the SAT, announced a change it hopes will relieve some of the stress. As of 2024, students will only take the standardized test on laptops or tablets at testing centers. The test will be shorter, two hours instead of three. Reading passages will reflect a wider range of topics to make the test more culturally relevant. On the math section, calculators will be allowed. Why do this now? There are a set of changes, benefits and improvements that we've been hearing from students and educators that we can only deliver if we're a digital test. Nearly 80% of U.S. colleges and universities will not require ACT or SAT scores for admission in fall of 2022. And during the pandemic, fewer students have been taking the SAT. Do you worry that that time may be outpacing the need for the SAT? The data shows that students still really want to take the SAT and see how they do. That gives colleges another data point and one that they want to make sure we keep making available to students. While many schools were moving away from the SATs before COVID, even more have taken that turn now. The shift in the SAT doesn't mean the SAT goes away. It just means the SAT becomes a part of a more robust picture of who a young person is. And we should all be thankful for that. Natalia took part in a pilot program for the digital SAT. I preferred the digital SAT version compared um, with the written SAT version because it was a lot more clear and concise. A standard test changing for the times. Rahima Ellis, NBC News. Up next for us tonight, the severe COVID restrictions in China just 10 days before the start of the Olympics. Although the Chinese government is reporting just a small number of new COVID cases, the country is taking drastic measures as thousands of athletes begin to arrive for the Olympics. Janice Mackey-Frayer is in Beijing. 
Tonight, China's government going to more extreme lengths to contain COVID cases 10 days before the Winter Olympics, abruptly sealing off neighborhoods in Beijing. Officials say they'll mass test 2 million people. There's nothing we can do to get rid of it, he says. The entire city caught in a dragnet over a handful of reported cases and ramped up fear. Anyone buying cold medication recently ordered to take a test to prove they aren't infected. As more people are being told they have to get tested, sites like this are popping up around the city. Beijing's first cases of the Omicron variant testing China's rigid zero tolerance for COVID. As world attention turns to China for the Olympics, Chinese leaders had hoped to showcase success in managing the virus. Beijing faces a dilemma, right? That might also right, explain you know, why so far they've refrained from imposing a city-wide lockdown. With Beijing under restrictions, athletes and officials are confined to a closed loop of walled-off hotels and venues accessible only to them. Already, games officials report 93 COVID cases inside the bubble, while outside, Chinese fans can no longer buy Olympics tickets. It's a pity, but there's no way, he says. Chinese officials are so fearful of crossover, drivers were warned to avoid Olympics vehicles, even if there's an accident. The city now in full emergency mode, days before the games begin. Janice Mackey Frayer, NBC News, Beijing. And up next for us, we'll show you what can happen when someone finds that message in a bottle. Finally, with all that's going on in the world, consider this simple message that started in Ocean City, Maryland, and was discovered in a bottle across the Atlantic. Here's Kristen Dahlgren. There is nothing more magical than a message in a bottle. So when Sasha Yonyak and his beloved neighbor and fishing partner, Mr. Wayne, found one three years ago, they decided to pay it forward, repacking the bottle with their own note. We went one mile offshore off Ocean City, Maryland, and we threw it in and it just started sailing. The now 14-year-old didn't give it much thought until this month. More than three years later and half a world away, Rita Simmons and Kieran Marin were walking on this Irish beach when they noticed something in the sand. You could see a wee bow was tied, tied up to something in the bottle. And uh, so we sort of knew right away we, there was a message in the bottle. It's a once in a lifetime thing. It's something you sort of dream of as a kid. And so they reached out to the boy who wrote the note, finding Sasha's father through Facebook. I was excited and surprised it actually made it somewhere. They connected online and have now forged a friendship. The universe has just brought us together. They're sending us family photos and uh, we're finding out a little bit more, you know, as we, uh, each day. New friends, a good reminder of an old one. Mr. Wayne died three months ago. That bottle just reflects the happy time that they had together. We found it at exactly the right time in Sasha's life. Hopefully, it'll bring him some good into his life. There's already talk of a visit to Ireland, thanks to a bottle, the sea, and the magic of friendship. Kristen Dahlgren, NBC News. How about that? That's nightly news for this Tuesday. Thank you for watching, everyone. I'm Lester Holt. Please take care of yourself and each other. Good night. with Emily Chang.
Emily Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, overshadowed Microsoft slowing cloud growth has investors overlooking the strong second quarter report. We will break down the results. Plus, mission abort. NVIDIA said to be preparing to abandon its $40 billion deal to acquire ARM. Now, ARM owner SoftBank is looking into an IPO. And by now, pay later seems to be just about everywhere now. I will talk with one of the biggest companies behind this new approach to layoff. All that in a moment, but first let's get a look at the markets and straight to those tech results out after the bell. Here's our Ed Ludlow, obviously Microsoft, yeah. the one we're watching. Yeah, the biggest name we're watching because it's the first mega cap to report this quarter. And if you look at the reaction in NASDAQ futures, my goodness, are they paying attention. Look, we're lower after the bell, down almost 5% in the aftermarket. We've been even lower than that. 20% top line growth in the quarter, fiscal second quarter, $51 billion of sales, beat on the bottom line. And yet the market, as you say, they're focusing on Asia and cloud, which grew at a rate of a humble, Emily. Guess what? 46%. 46% growth in cloud and the market's disappointed. So clearly the bar was very high for a top line beat here. And worries about decelerating growth. We're going to hear about this all season long. Some positivity, though, Texas Instruments. I love Texas Instruments. Really interesting. Time to nerd out because it's the biggest maker, of course, of analog processors. It goes into all kinds of gadgetry. You see there that the stock's up more than one and a half percent in after hours, partly because the outlook for the first quarter from Texas so good on a day that semiconductors were getting hammered. But let's look at the day. This was a risk off day. Tech stocks under pressure. We de did see dip buyers come in. We saw the Nasdaq 100 pair some losses, but then it gave up towards the end of the session, closing down two and a half percent. Bitcoin has improved, though. If you look at the cryptocurrency space, Bitcoin came from a kind of low bar, 33,000 on Monday. We're trading around 36,700 per token right now. But the Bloomberg Galaxy Crypto Index, which has a number of constituents broadly lower as the crypto space and some of those lower market value coins under pressure. And we talk about semiconductors, the SOX, the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index, closes up 1.3% Monday, down almost 4% Tuesday. A big reason, if you look at the points movers to the downside, NVIDIA. Let me bring you this Bloomberg scoop, really important. According to sources, NVIDIA is quietly preparing to give up on its acquisition of ARM, as you said. According to one source, they just privately don't think the deal can get done. They don't think it can get past regulators. This is a big story, and clearly it's had an impact on the industry and the market paying attention, Emily. Absolutely. We're going to get, dig into NVIDIA a bit more later this hour. I want to get back to Microsoft now, though. Thanks, Ed, and bring in Jeremy Goldman of Insider Intelligence. Jeremy, Microsoft shares still under pressure down, still about 7.5% after hours. What's your big takeaway? What's going wrong here? Well, I would actually say that there are a lot of strong fundamentals to look at for the future. Uh, and there's obviously a lot of market pressure uh, that is, you know, you, you can't really extricate from the larger market uh, picture. Uh, obviously, there is that slowing cloud growth, and that's something to pay attention to. I think another thing to pay attention to is that they've got, I believe, about five or so divisions that are growing at at least 29% year over year, which uh, I think a lot of companies would uh, actually be pretty happy about. So does the slowing cloud growth concern you to the extent that, you know, we're emerging slowly, albeit out of this pandemic? And what does that mean for what's been a massive driver of their business over the next few years? Yeah, I think that the slowing cloud growth, it, it, it's notable, you know, it, it is definitely a call out. Uh, at the same time, you know, uh, Azure is making pretty significant inroads into AWS. Uh, so that's something to, that's also important to pay attention to. And then also as Microsoft looks to the future, uh, I would say that gaming and metaverse related immersive technologies are going to be more and more important to their overall growth. So to me, it's not about necessarily what is, has happened, but what does that portend to uh, the quarters ahead? Now, let's talk about the deal everyone is talking about, the massive deal for Activision. Does that uh, make you more excited 
about Microsoft's future? Are you at all concerned about the cultural issues? And obviously, this is such a behemoth, uh, you know, a big deal to take on as it is. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I come from the bias of uh, rather than being a financial analyst, we're you know covering marketing and uh, immersive technologies and how brands can take advantage of them. So, given that you know Microsoft seems uh, well po uh, poised to take uh, more revenues out of the gaming space over the next few years, obviously, the Activision Blizzard deal is a big part of that. But more importantly, they've shown that they have the ability to make major acquisitions in the gaming world and then figure out how to incorporate it into everything else that they're doing, right? Uh, it's important to note that, uh, you know, Satya Nadella, I think even cited the metaverse as a major ambition for Microsoft uh, well before uh, Meta Platforms renamed itself. Uh, so. I think based off of that, you know, you can definitely see a lot of synergistic uh, opportunities with uh, the recent gaming planned acquisition. Do you see this giving Microsoft a head start in the metaverse, perhaps even uh, faster, farther than Meta uh, ha has come so far, or you know, Apple with its AR glasses that you know the company reportedly has been working on, but we haven't seen yet. I mean, in short, yes. Uh, part of the reason is that Microsoft is basically acquiring users right now, right? If you look at major games like uh, Call of Duty, uh, they have, they're essentially the fundamental uh, building blocks to building a metaverse, right? Uh, you can take these games and then you can start to do things that uh, we wouldn't necessarily call gaming and start to do them within these gaming-like environments that are immersive. So obviously Microsoft doesn't have as much of an investment in the uh, metaverse uh, hardware uh, as some companies like Meta do, but they, they still have quite a bit, and I think user acquisition is often the name of the game. All right, Jeremy Goldman of Insider Intelligence. We're gonna keep watching those Microsoft shares move in after hours. Thanks for your insight there. Now to an anniversary like no other. Just one year ago, the Wall Street Bets Reddit phenomenon basically kicked off that meme stock momentum that we are still seeing today, leading to Robinhood halting the buying of GameStop on its platform. The online brokerage then faced the fury of customers, lawmakers, and regulators to talk about the changes Robinhood has made one year on. Bloomberg's Annie Massa, who covers Robin Hood with us now. Annie, thank you so much for joining us. Put this into context. Gosh, it's crazy to remember where we were a year ago and what's happened since then. You know, talk to us about what this milestone really signifies. Sure. So Robin Hood has had a crazy past year. They already had r risen to prominence during the pandemic when more retail traders were piling into the stock market and options markets and crypto trading. But that really reached another dimension during the GameStop episode that happened exactly a year ago. And that put Robinhood on the radar of many more people and also led to a huge influx of retail investors. Now, what's happened in the past year is Robinhood has IPO'd, and now it is a publicly traded company itself, but its own stock price has been tanking alongside this kind of slow uh, grind of fewer uh, retail investors uh, being in the market. There is still elevated participation, but it's nowhere near what we were seeing about a year ago when GameStop was really uh, reaching a fever pitch. Uh, Robin Hood just put out a blog post reflecting on what a year it has been. Robin Hood was founded on a dream, they say, of helping more people invest for their futures. The retail investing revolution has shown us that a new generation of investors wants their voices to be heard. Our work has only just begun. Why do you think the stock price is falling? What has changed? There are a couple of factors. I think you've seen uh, investors have kind of come off of this idea that Robinhood is purely a financial technology company doing something extremely different from other publicly traded brokerages. Right now, I mean, it's brokerage business in uh, stock options, crypto trading 
Th that is something that's available at other brokerages as well. There was also this moment where it seemed like investors uh, were only choosing Robinhood or it was maybe the most prominent brokerage name for a while. And a bit of that luster may have worn off as well as, uh, as investors dug in a little bit more. So it's certainly not um, necessarily going to dog them forever, but it's been a setback as uh, public markets investors have taken a closer look at this company. We did just cover Robinhood adding some new features to its platform, the ability for retail investors to ask questions of CEOs on earnings calls if they're upvoted via the Robinhood platform thanks to their say technology acquisition. Earnings are coming up. What are your expectations there? Could that lead to uh, you know, a change in the trajectory quickly? So something to watch for in the earn in the earnings on Thursday is how retail investor participation has been going and and uh, how many uh, people they have using their platforms broadly across the market. We've seen retail investor participation in U.S. stock trading fall off of those highs from last year. So that could be a setback uh, for Robinhood if that trend continues. All right, Bloomberg's Annie Massa will continue to watch your coverage. Thanks. Another story we're watching, President Biden will meet with more than half a dozen CEOs Wednesday who support Build Back Better, including a number of big Silicon Valley names. The White House is looking for a way to pass president's, the president's economic agenda, which the administration says will strengthen the economy as well as workforce participation. We'll be monitoring that meeting tomorrow. Coming up, meantime, tensions between the U.S. and Russia keep rising. We have no intention of putting American forces or NATO forces in Ukraine. But uh, we are, you know, as I said, there are going to be serious economic consequences if he moves. We'll have more on those sanctions, plus the cybersecurity warning the Biden administration just issued about Russia. That's next. This is Bloomberg. I was here in 2014 when the United States first took actions when uh, Russia invaded Crimea, and the options we're considering today are far more significant than the options we had taken then. All options are on the table. Um, what we've done is that we've worked closely with our allies in Europe to make sure that we have a carefully designed set of sanctions that would have a significant impact on the Russian economy. We have a shared goal in terms of respecting the sovereignty of Ukraine and um, in terms of standing up and ensuring that we have sanctions at the ready in case a Russian troop enters Ukraine. U.S. Deputy Treasury Secretary Wally Adeyemo outlining the Biden administration's plan of action to sanction Russia. The U.S. has put 8,500 troops on alert for possible deployment. This is Russia has as many as 100,000 troops on the border near eastern Ukraine. At the same time, the Department of Homeland Security is issuing a warning that Russia could levy cyber attacks against the U.S. in retaliation, warning that Russia could target critical infrastructure. For more on all this, I'm joined by General Keith Alexander, the former commander of U.S. Cyber Command, also the founder and co-CEO of IronNet. General Alexander, great to have your perspective on this. Obviously, cyber attacks from Russia, the threat of them, are nothing new. What makes this time different? Well, I think right now, uh, President Putin is looking at his options of how do I take over eastern Ukraine? It's clear that moving 100,000 troops on the border is a significant statement by him that he's serious about this. I think he's still weighing his options. And I think what the president, our president, and Europe is trying to do is how do we keep him from going in, uh, going into eastern Ukraine and doing what he did eight years ago in Crimea. I think that's what he's trying to, trying to do. And I think he believes it's a good time to do it. There's a lot of opportunity here. And he's weighing the consequences, those increased sanctions, 
and Europe and the United States coming together to do that versus him getting Eastern Ukraine, which he's always wanted. So this has gone on for a while. I think he's now putting a statement in. It's a good opportunity from his perspective. What's the cost? What is the cost? Well, I think from my perspective, the cost would be they've got NATO and the U.S. aligned and Europe aligned on this. I think we've got everybody leaning in. It was a great move, I think, by the administration in Europe to start bringing in more oil from the Middle East into Europe. I think that's a huge statement because that's a long time enduring economic impact on Russia. And it means that we can, Europe can live without Russian oil and gas, and here's how we're gonna do it. So I think that that's key. What I worry about, though, is, as you mentioned this, is that the attacks on the Ukraine could just go in cyber like they did in 2017. And if you recall, those not Petya attacks impacted the world, FedEx, Maersk, Merck. That destructive wiper virus caused a tremendous amount of problems for everyone. We could see the same thing here, and it could grow. And my concern is this could get out of hand. Cyber is an element of national power. It's one element, and as soon as it escalates, you, we have a problem. That's what I would be most concerned about from my former time. What about when it comes to a possible cyber attack on the United States? What would you be most concerned about there? Is it an attack on critical infrastructure? Is it an attack on you know hospital records, the power grid, the supply chain? Each one of those has different consequences from my perspective. If you think about what are they going to hit, you know, there are devastating attacks that they could do against the energy, the oil and gas sector. Think Colonial Pipeline and a number of those. Actions they could do against hospitals. But if they do that against hospitals, that has a different, I think, set with our people. Going after energy and shutting down the pipelines, the oil and gas, what would that do to our will to engage? That's the question. You know, what Russia is going to look at, what can they do to impact the will of the American people? And what can they do to impact the will of the European people in this conflict? That's That will to fight, that will to push back is something that we have to consider. It could backfire. They could think we're gonna do this and it would backfire as it did in World War II. So I think these are the things that we have to consider. As you look at this, Emily, what it all comes back to is what Chris English talked about a few weeks ago and what they did in the Solarium Commission. We have to now think about cyber as an element of national power, how we're going to bring the, the public and private sector together to defend this right. nation and to work with our allies. We've got to get that going. What kind of cyber actions on the United States or Ukraine would lead the U.S. to retaliate? And what kind of offensive cyber actions do you imagine the U.S. would take? Well, I think there's both covert and overt operations and things that we do. I'm, I'm sure they would consider all of those. And really what the National Security Council would do is bring all that together. They'd bring in General Nakasone and the team and say, what options do we have? What can we do to respond? What would we do diplomatically? What would we do economically? What can we do in cyber? And what other actions can we and our allies take? All of that comes up with a series of capabilities that the president and the principals committee would look at. In taking all that together, from my perspective, you're, you've hit some of the key things. Critical infrastructure, what do they do? If you hit critical infrastructure and it causes significant damage to this country, I believe it will not go without a response. And what that response would be is where the president has a choice uh, and the secretary of defense. They can get together and say, what are we going to do? And each of those, the calculation has to go we don't want another war, but we can't let people like 
President Putin just take over countries like they did Crimea. And right. we're, we're going to see multiple sites of this, Emily, and we're seeing it in the Middle East and you're seeing it in Asia. And this okay. is a really tough time. Uh, and I believe it's going to get worse. All right. We'll keep watching. Thank you for that warning, General Keith Alexander of Ironet Cybersecurity. Thank you, as always, for stopping by. Coming up, Netflix betting big on the Asia-Pacific re region on the heels of a brutal sell-off. Our conversation with the company's vice president of contact for APAC. Next, this is Bloomberg. The pressure on Netflix not easing up after its massive sell-off. The streaming giant now looking to the Asia-Pacific region to help drive new growth. Bloomberg spoke to Min Young Kim, vice president of content for APAC, and asked if she's concerned about declining subscriber growth. Take a listen. Not really. Uh, I think what really drives our growth is the strong slate. And if I think about the slate that's upcoming in Asia in 2022, uh, I'm, me, my team, and all of our Netflix employees, along with the fans of content made in Asia, are very excited of what's coming. Uh, in COVID, we, we've had a couple of headwinds in terms of the production. Uh, there were a little bit of production delays, and Omicron has unfortunately sort of set, set back us a little bit. But we're very confident that we will be able to bring another set of strong sites in 2022. And if you look at 20, 2021, APAC was at the forefront of really driving the growth for our uh, service. And I do believe that it will continue in 2022. Yeah, let's uh, talk a little more about that slate, because uh, Korean language productions with a real breakout hit of uh, 2021, and you've recently announced the latest uh, Korean content lineup. So how does this reflect your, your strategy for dealing with demand around Korean content? Um, well, so last week uh, was an exciting, uh, we had an exciting announcement that really sort of pleased a lot of members on Netflix and outside of Netflix who really enjoy Korean content. We've announced about 25 shows, a very wide variety of different genre and format. Uh, and I mean, last year, I think we all know that we uh, the world has actually responded in huge numbers uh, on their love for Korean content. I think Squid Game really helped us drive that love and uh, excitement. Um, and, but you know, so that's uh, on, on that 25 slate, uh, we have shows like All of Us Are Dead, uh, and we also have shows like Money Heist Korea, which is an adaptation of our popular Spanish series. We're also very excited to present our first set of our original film production and also our unscripted programming followed by the recent success of Singles Inferno. But what, what I want to emphasize is when it comes to local content, what we're really aiming for is uh, local impact. We want to make sure mm -hmm. that we program our service around Korean content to please our Korean members and our members in Asia. And I think it's just exciting mm -hmm. that with the increased demand on Korean content, the world is just enjoying what we're watching together. Min Young Kim there, Netflix Vice President of Content for APAC with Bloomberg Sherry on and Paul Allen. Coming up, a new trend continues to gain steam as more shoppers choose. Buy now, pay later. Our exclusive interview with Klarna CEO and co-founder Sebastian Shimakovsky, one of the industry's biggest players, ahead. This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Bloomberg has learned that NVIDIA is preparing to abandon its purchase of ARM from SoftBank. The company has made little to no progress in winning approval for the $40 billion chip deal. Meantime, SoftBank is stepping up preparations for an ARM IPO as an alternative. Our Ian King, who covers chips, joins us now. Ian, is the ARM deal dead at this point? Yeah, I mean, what our reporting showed is that there are significant groups within both companies that really are just are bowing to what they believe is the inevitability of this not making it through the you know, regulatory process and that it's just not going to happen. And publicly, of course, though, we, we need to point out that the companies are both saying, look, it, it still is going to happen and are sticking with the, working their way through that process still. So what's next for ARM if NVIDIA can't buy it? Yeah, no, that's a very good question. All along, SoftBank has said, look, an IPO is, 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 is our kind of our plan B. It's what they were going to do before NVIDIA came along and asked them the money but, and, and offered the, all of the money. But, it, you know, the big question there is, is sort of where and when and, and how much, you know, can SoftBank raise in the process of an IPO depending upon where chip valuations are. And, and you know, the bottom line is that it's probably going to be difficult for them to get the same kind of return that they would get if they were going to be paid in NVIDIA stock. Now, it's no secret that NVIDIA's competitors didn't necessarily want this deal to happen. Take a listen to what Qualcomm CEO Cristiano Amon told us a few months ago. Arm already won. And they won because they're independent. It's not like you need one company to buy Arm to invest in Arm for them to win. He's saying there he wants ARM to stay independent. Basically, you know, what does this mean for NVIDIA's competitors? Is this good news for them? Yeah, I mean, you know, you've just had a CEO of a company publicly talking about M&A between, you know, competitors and suppliers. I mean, it doesn't get more direct than that. And then, you know, in, in our story today, we mentioned a whole host of other large companies that really don't like this deal as well. So. Yes, you could say it is a, a victory for them. NVIDIA would counter and say, look, we were going to give ARM a ton of money and we were going to keep it independent. So who's the loser there? But obviously they, they don't buy that argument. They don't buy the argument that NVIDIA could invest in ARM, own it and keep it independent. Today, the Biden administration said, meantime, the chip shortage is going to continue at least through the end of this year. What's the outlook on how to turn this around and how the government can and will help? Yeah, I know that's, that's the, the key question, Emily, you've asked there. We've known that this report was coming for a while and what they've really done is come along and say, oh, hey, we're going to do something about this. And then they've gone through the reporting process and come up with the answer, which is, yeah, it's pretty much what the industry said it was, which is pretty bad for some areas of the economy. And, oh, we kind of have to leave this to the private sector to sort this out. So not a great conclusion for, you know, the automakers and, and various other, you know, key components of the economy that really are suffering because of the shortage of, of semiconductors. All right, Ian King, who covers chips for us, as always, thanks for your reporting. Meantime, a host of new players in consumer finance have retailers getting excited and regulators asking questions. The so-called buy now, pay later space lets shoppers take home purchases immediately while effectively taking out short-term loans. In the U.S., use of services like Klarna and Afterpay has jumped 300% every year since 2018. Joining us now, Sebastian Shimionkovsky, Klarna CEO and co-founder. Sebastian, great to have you back with us. So look, regulators are asking questions. What does that mean for growth that you see ahead this year? Is it still going to jump that 300%? Uh, yes, very much so, I believe, actually. I, I think it's a good thing they're asking questions. We've seen similar things in Europe previously. But I mean, I, I think one thing to put in perspective here, in 2019, Americans paid 
14 billion dollars in late fees to credit card companies. Uh, they paid 120 billion dollars uh, per year in credit card interest and fees. And the buy now pay later services are interest free and uh, you know free of charges for consumers. So with that in perspective, it just tells you how much growth opportunity there is to disrupt that industry and try to provide a better service for consumers. Well, the CFPB launched an investigation into the industry last month, and I'm curious what your interactions with the agency have been so far. Do you get the sense they want to see the industry grow or they want to take a pause? Well, I think that as any regulators, when something new comes uh, it comes uh, wrong, right? They want to try to understand it. Is this actually something good or bad? And what's the implications for consumers? You know, are they following best practice standards? And what's the implications? If you, uh, uh, as I would maybe at this point, I call it more a query than an investigation. But, but with that said, you know, I think it's healthy. I think they should be asking questions. And there may be, there may be aspects of products that, you know, where regulation should be improved. It could be changed. We've seen that in, in the UK as an example, where there's a suggestion for improved legislation that Klana supports. Um, but again, if you look at like, if you look at the data, which most regulators eventually tend to start doing, we see our credit card, you know, our losses are 30, 40% below industry standards of credit cards. So these type of credits are better for consumers because there's an underwriting decision per every transaction, which is very different from how you know, credit card works where you just get a huge limit and then go out and spend it. And the banks doesn't really care. They just want you to maximize your debt. But let's talk about what's better for retailers, because as I understand it, most buy now, pay later options ask the merchant to pay 6% of whatever a customer is buying. Merchants aren't happy about paying 2% to the credit card company. So how are you convincing them to pay that 6%? Yeah, I wish I could convince them to pay 6%, but it was a, <laughs> a long time ago I heard any deal that we're in, mm. in being quoted at those levels. I think that uh, the price has dropped due to competition. I, you know, I think those were uh, levels that were, you know, s slightly crazy at maybe at the beginning. But today we're seeing more uh, competitive rates, and uh, and to us it's actually, you know, we if you look at uh, Klarna, we compete in a market in Europe which is regulated in regards to interchange both on debit and credit and have been able to reach such scale with almost 100 million users now that we can very effectively compete with credit cards from a cost perspective as well. And we have the ambition to reach that uh, economies of scales in the US with reaching now almost 25 million users. So I think over time, we believe that we can become really competitive when we are both pushing costs of payments down and providing better services for consumers and merchants. So, but, you know, obviously initially when you enter market, you may, you know, you, you may not necessarily be able to price there just yet. So I think we're going to see those costs come closer to each other over time. Interesting. Well, every time you're on, I got to ask you how your thoughts are evolving on crypto. We are currently feeling the chill of a Crypto winter, not sure it's how long it's going to last. How are you thinking about this and the future of Klarna plus crypto? Right. Well, we obviously won a few players of our size that have kind of kept away. And I, you know, as, uh, as I've said previously, I think about it in two ways. I think about it as an asset and as a technology. As a technology, we've been trying to apply it to somehow make our services work better, become more efficient or, you know, at lower cost. Have just not been able to apply the technology in such a way that it's helped anything. Uh, as an asset, look, uh, you know, people put money in all tons of different assets. Some some people put it in nice old paintings and some people in, you know, in gold and some people in something else, like preferably I, I really like paintings, uh, you know, uh, more than uh, crypto, but that's obviously a matter of taste. Uh, but I'm very worried how it seems to be the case that none of the regulation we have in regards to how to, you know, market uh, 
assets or equity instruments and so forth that apply to stock. If I would go out and do the kind of advertising for Klarna stock as being done for crypto, uh, I would most likely end up in jail. And so that is very, very uh, worrying thing to me because I do worry there might be some crypto holders that have borrowed money, that have used credit to buy more. And as prices, if prices continue to drop, uh, we may see some very negative consequences and some, you know, some very sad outcomes as a consequence of that. So I, I sincerely hope that we will at least will see some more sanity around how these products are being advertised and that they follow the same standards that any other financial investment categories have on them. Interesting. All right. Well, I'm glad I'm asked you for an update. Thanks again for joining us, Sebastian Chimiankovsky. Klarna CEO and co-founder, appreciate you stopping by. Coming up, 2021, it was a record year for VC funding. Money poured in. But will 2022 bring the same, or will we see a cooling off there as well? My interview next with Amant Taneha of General Catalyst. Up next, this is Bloomberg. We all know 2021 was a record year for VC fundraising and investing, but as we continue to watch the markets whiplash, some investors are wondering if there's a disconnect between valuations and if a funding correction could be coming. While that could take months or years, my next guest is issuing his own warning to VCs and founders about the need to invest in companies that are more sustainable and get away from the ones that move fast and break things. Remember Facebook's old tagline? Joining me now, Hemant Taneja. He is the managing partner at General Catalyst, out with a new book, Intended Consequences, How to Build Market-Leading Companies with Responsible Innovation. So what counts, Hemant, as responsible in innovation? Are you talking about profits or mission or building a diverse team? Emily, responsible innovation is a <clears throat> mindset and mechanisms uh, to build companies that simultaneously optimize financial and societal return. I think if you think about uh, technology, we don't build software for different stakeholders in the economy anymore. We actually build very important businesses, sometimes building healthcare businesses or banks or insurance companies. The responsibility around those is so much greater than what tech used to do that we do need a playbook around how to build these companies in a way that they're fundamentally in the interests of society. Well, VCs also have a role to play, and you actually call out Reid Hoffman, the co-founder of LinkedIn, partner at Greylock, for his uh, method of blitz scaling. What do you think is wrong with that? Well, look, first of all, Reed's a great fan. And, uh, you know, blitzscaling represents a playbook for growth. Uh, how we build uh, companies that can scale fast uh, once they've gotten product market fit. And there's actually nothing wrong with that, except that when you're moving really fast, there can be um, unintended consequences. And so what we are advocating in this book is to also have a playbook for uh, responsible innovation, mindset and mechanisms, the business model choices, product choices, governance, that allows you to make sure these companies are not moving fast and breaking things uh, and are actually building for all stakeholders in society. Speaking of Meta, of course, formerly known as Facebook, I recently spoke with Andrew Bosworth, who's, of course, running their AR efforts, now the CTO. Here's what he had to say about responsible innovation there. I think we can do a lot better job than we have historically because we have a historical record of the types of abuses that have happened in digitally connected spaces. Should we believe Facebook or now Meta? Are they a responsible innovator? Look, any company has the opportunity to learn from its past and make intentional choices going to the, to the future. 
Um, I think uh, uh, we're hopeful that even at Meta, uh, you've got lots of great people that are thinking about those choices as well. The key is going to be to think through what's best for all the stakeholders, and let's see how they do. Now, we're seeing, obviously, a big public equity, public tech equity sell-off. Is this leaving you at all concerned about a pullback in the private markets? I know you work at earlier stages. We hear from VCs all the time. They're not paying attention to what's happening in the public markets. But I wonder if all this money flowing in, all these high valuations that we're seeing, if there's a correction coming. Yeah, look, most people don't understand the impact of interest rates on valuations. A percent increase in interest rates typically leads to 15 to 20 percent reduction in valuations when you do discounted cash flow models. So I think some of this is actually not uh, a surprise. I think markets anticipating the, the interest rate uh, rise. And honestly, the world of near zero Fed, Fed rates and also 7% inflation didn't make sense anyways. So this is actually healthy. I, I'm actually hoping that this mindset and this correction can start to impact how we're also building companies and funding them and, and scaling them in the uh, private markets as well. Because, you know, there's phenomenal opportunities. There's a lot of capital that's been raised. But at the end of the day, we're not going to build great companies if we overcapitalize and uh, uh, don't build responsibly. So I think it, it uh, hopefully will slow us down, make us more intentional and, and build better companies. All right. Well, we'll be watching to see if that indeed happens. Hemant Taneja, General Catalyst Managing Partner, thank you for stopping by. Coming up, a stock rebound attempt fails as investors remain on edge over the Fed and those rates we were just talking about. We're going to take a look at how the tech sector is playing a role next. This is Bloomberg. Apple's first product launch event of 2022 is fast approaching, and it's likely to be all about a new iPhone and a new iPad. The company is planning to hold its first event of the year this spring in either March or April. So what's on tap? A new iPhone SE with a faster processor, and for the first time in that model, 5G. The new device is likely to take a similar shape to the SE from 2020, and it will offer Apple users a low cost 5G alternative to the iPhone 12 and the iPhone 13. A new iPad's also likely, with the company planning for this year a new iPad Air with 5G and a faster chip to replace the current Air launched late in 2020. The new products will start a giant rollout of new devices for Apple in 2022, which is slated to include four revamped iPhone 14 models, three new Apple Watch variations, a revamped MacBook Air with a new chip, a new Mac Pro desktop, a larger Pro iMac, updated AirPods earbuds, a new low-cost iPad, and even an all-new iPad Pro with MagSafe wireless charging. The SC and the Air aren't Apple's breadwinners, but they do represent key products that retain users in the larger Apple ecosystem and can even possibly pull in switchers from Android and other rival platforms. For those awaiting the iPhone 14, expect a new design with a smaller camera cut out on the front, a much faster processor, and far better cameras. I'm Mark Ehrman. This is Power On. And don't forget, you can subscribe to Mark's weekly Power On newsletter at Bloomberg.com. I want to get back to the markets. Take uh, stock as we dive into a busy earnings season for the world's biggest companies to watch. We've already gotten Microsoft and IBM numbers. Next up, Intel and Tesla Wednesday, Apple coming up Thursday, and next week, Facebook parent Meta and Google parent Alphabet, plus a whole lot more. R.I. Ludlow 
here to break it all down. Ed, still following those Microsoft numbers and still looking at right. not, not great investor reaction. Yeah, the bulls had really pinned a lot of hope on this week. And next week, you know, going into this week in particular, so much volatility around tech stocks, the focus being the Fed and the outlook for rates. Then you come back from the weekend. There's a lot of nervousness about geopolitical risk, tensions between the Ukraine and Russia. And if you read the Wall Street notes, everyone was really hoping for not just top line beats, but bottom line beats as well, because before Monday, seven of the S&P 500 companies that reported had done really well from an earnings beat perspective. Then we got Microsoft. And if you look at the aftermarket reaction, not just Microsoft itself, but NASDAQ 100 futures, ETFs that track the NASDAQ 100, they're both down. And gosh, does it set a pretty grumpy tone for the rest of the, this week. Talk to us about what's driving today specifically. Obviously, we got NVIDIA, not right. good for the rest of the semiconductors. Yeah, this was a big scoop from Bloomberg. And you just look at where NVIDIA sits within the spectrum of the big points movers on the NASDAQ 100. I think I'm right in saying it was the second biggest points laggard. You know, it has outsized influence. It's grown so enormously over the course of the pandemic in terms of the gains in its share price. So when we have news like this, it does move the index lower. And it's kind of, again, it's another risk factor, right? It's uncertainty. It's investors saying, uh-oh, this is something else we have to worry about in this industry. And as you know, Emily, because I asked you about it yesterday, the index has had its worst start since 1994. You've got to go back a long way for semiconductors to do so poorly. So talk to us about what's on tap this week with Tesla, especially, obviously, a company that you follow closely. Yeah, it's really interesting. We've been talking as a newsroom, well, what do we treat Tesla as, right? Do you remember em, in the last 18 months where we were sort of getting really obsessed about Tesla being profitable? And then Tesla joined the S&P 500. It did that. Six consecutive quarters of profit added to the S&P 500. It's really ramped up its production of vehicles to just numbers that we didn't think it would be able to achieve in the context of the semiconductor shortage in global supply chain crunches. So what do we look to? Well, just really boring stuff, financials. How is its margin doing? Its automotive margin and gross margin. How much money is it making from regulatory credits? And we know that Elon Musk is going to appear at this earnings call because, remember, he said he's not interested in them anymore. So what's he going to say? What's he got up his sleeve? <laughs> all right. Well, we'll be watching. We'll be having you helping us break it all down. Ed, thank you. Well, the number, the days of number two pencils and filling in bubbles are going away for high school students. The College Board says the SAT is going digital. It'll make the change internationally next year and in 2024 in the U.S. The goal to make the test more relevant as more colleges make it optional for admissions. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Tune in tomorrow. We've got more on the buy now, pay later landscape. Plus, we'll be speaking exclusively with a firm CEO, Max Levchin, of course, a competitor of Klarna. We're also going to be joined by Kevin Meyer, co-CEO of Candle and Course, former head of Disney Streaming and former CEO of TikTok. You don't want to miss it. This is Bloomberg.
One place to start tonight, and that is with our exclusive interview with Erling Haaland. The Borussia Dortmund striker is expected to leave the club in the summer, with European football's biggest clubs all vying for his signature. Can't wait to get the thoughts of Carve and Darmesh on this one. But Haaland said earlier this month that Dortmund were putting pressure on him to make a decision over his future, but today he explained why he felt he needed to say something. I think uh, I don't really want to say too much about it, uh, but uh, I felt it was time for me to say something. Um, a lot of others were speaking, uh, so uh, so that was it. Uh, and uh, now I I really don't want to say too much more about it. I think uh, said has been said, and uh, we move on. Where do you feel now that you can most improve? I think. Uh, I can improve on everything. Uh, if you say I'm good finishing, uh, I can uh, improve my finishing a lot. And uh, yeah, everything. I can become faster, so I can improve that. I can become stronger, so I can improve that. Uh, but um, if I should improve one thing, that is to uh, don't be injured. Because if I'm not injured, I'll play much more games and I will deliver even better. I, I would guess when, when you choose to go to Dortmund, uh, there is a development club, you develop and check, check, you have done uh, everything, but you must miss the fans. Tell us just uh, about, about how you must miss the fans to kind of play with them. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't like it. Uh, I've been saying this before, uh, football you can see now, uh, now we don't have any fans in the stadium anymore uh, and uh, you see in England it's a um, full stadium and uh, if you look on TV uh, you rather put on the, the English game because it's full fans and it's, it's more emotions and it's, uh, it's more alive the game and uh, it's, it's not nice. I, as I said before, I really miss the fans. You were in a team of the year by FIFA, the best, called uh, Congratulations. Um, big honor and be on the stage there. I mean, interview by the legendary Arsene Wenger. Uh, if you were to vote, because there is always voting system, if you're going to vote one, two, three, how would you have voted on players? Oof. That's a good question. It was uh, the last year, right? Uh, um, uh, I think you have to say, yeah, you have to say Lewandowski. Uh, he, uh, Lewandowski number one. Yeah, Lewandowski number one. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then you have, uh, for me, Benzema has also been amazing uh, but also i mean messi is also outstanding so Benzema and messi on uh, shared second and uh, third place i think i have to say favorite food um, um i love food so i normally i cannot say one thing but uh, i really like uh, kebab i have to say that kebab pizza Kebab. Yeah, I, really, I love it. So you will sit in your Bugatti with a kebab? No, I will if, not. If in your future? No, I will not. Uh, but uh, that doesn't mean I eat it all the time. I eat it a couple times a year uh, when I'm home in my hometown. Uh, but uh, I almost never eat it, but it's still my favorite food. Favorite drink? Uh, I think I have to say uh, pina colada. Pina colada? <laughs> really good. Okay. Good. I love the answer. The lad likes kebabs and pina coladas. Tell you what's got me thinking. I'm going to ask you all where, uh, where he's going to end up at the end of this little chat, actually. Um, Carve, let's start with you. Because Arlen said it's, um, it's been a day he, need, he felt he needed to speak. Well, it's your turn to speak now. What do you think of all this? Well, look, I think um, he was asked about the comments he made a couple of weeks ago. 
and he didn't really want to talk about them too much because there was quite a reaction when he said what he said. And what he said was that he felt like he was under pressure from Borussia Dortmund to tell them what he wanted to do in the summer. Uh, now, he's in this unique situation where in his contract there's a release clause and he can leave Borussia Dortmund for £64 million this summer. Obviously, he is the best young striker in the world at the moment. Uh, all the top clubs in the world want to sign him. And Borussia Dortmund want to know, what are you going to do next? Because Borussia Dortmund need to make plans as well. Because if Haaland is leaving in the summer, uh, they need to start thinking about replacements. So that is what he was referring to in the interview about not wanting to go over what he said a couple of weeks ago. Because every time he talks about his future, uh, there is a lot of interest and uh, people uh, try and speculate about where he's going to end up and what he's going to do next. So I think that is why he was being so guarded when it came to anything to do with transfers during that interview. It was interesting hearing what he had to say. It was great to have that interview uh, with Sky in English as well. I, what, what do you think of the summer then, guys? I mean, who, who are going to be the front runners? Like you say, an awful lot of teams are going to be interested. Who's, who's going to be in Carmo the mix? Carmo mentioned £64 million pounds there. That's only going to be the small figure in this deal yeah. because you're talking about agents fees and you're going to talk about astronomical wages for Erling Haaland. I mean I've seen estimates that this deal could be worth around 250 million pounds all in. Oh. So that's how much you will have to outlay to buy Erling Haaland. He's only 21 years old. His journey so far Molde, RB Salzburg and then Borussia Dortmund. You just wonder whether the next move in his career is the final big one or not. But at 21, maybe not. And so is Mino Raiola thinking there's still a couple of big moves left? Now, if he was to go to the Premier League, we've, we've been talking about this before, haven't we? If he goes to the Premier League, how can another club, apart from a Premier League club, get him out of a Premier League club? Because... It's very unlikely that a big club like City or, or a United would want to insert any kind of release clause into Erling Haaland's contract. Whereas if he went to a Barcelona or a Real Madrid, then even though they are massive clubs, some say the biggest clubs in the world, financially they could still do another move to the Premier League. And if they, um, Haaland went to one of ha uh, Barcelona or Real Madrid. I don't think they would be averse to maybe putting in a release clause of around 130, 140, 150 million pounds because there's still a chance that a Premier League team can come in for Haaland and buy him for that much money. And then, say, for example, he has three or four years at Barcelona or Real Madrid, then he makes the move to the Premier League. So, of course, there are going to be the biggest Premier League clubs who want Erling Haaland this summer. I just wonder whether Mina Raiola and Erling Haaland have got a different plan for the journey for the rest of his career. Look, I think the latest information we have about Haaland's future is uh, if we had to say where he was going to go today, I think we would say that he will go to Real Madrid. Uh, it looks like Real Madrid are going to get Kylian Mbappe on a free transfer this summer. I think they will try and get Haaland as well. And I think the player himself would want to go and play for Real Madrid. Also bear in mind that Real Madrid have got Karim Benzema, who's done such an excellent job at the club. But he can't go on forever, so he needs to be replaced. And you'd have to say that Haaland would be the perfect long-term replacement for him. Now, if Haaland was to come to the Premier League, if he was to come to England, then as things stand, Manchester City 
are leading the race for him. We know they're looking for an out-and-out -out striker. Obviously, they tried to get Harry Kane last summer. Uh, they are signing uh, Julian Alvarez from River Plate, but I think he's more a player for the future. So I think they will try and sign him as well. If he is to come to England, I would say Manchester City. But another club I wouldn't discount, and listening to what Erling had to say about Robert Lewandowski being his favourite player last year, I keep being told that if Robert Lewandowski is to leave Bayern Munich this summer and go to PSG, uh, for example, then Bayern Munich would try and sign Haaland uh, from Dortmund. I'm not sure whether they could afford the kind of astronomical numbers that Darmesh just referred to. A lot of people saying Bayern Munich couldn't pay those kind of numbers, but I think they will try. But at the moment, I would say Real Madrid in England, Manchester City, don't discount uh, Bayern Munich. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna put you both on the spot. I know you don't like this, but I just think I like doing it to be honest. So I'm gonna do it, and I, I, I'll start to take the pressure off a little bit. We're all gonna say where we think Erling Haaland will be playing come the start of next season. What tunnel is he gonna be running down into? What arena and in what shirt? I'll go first. <laughs> He said he liked pina coladas and kebabs. I can tell you right now, the best pina coladas are down the quayside in Newcastle, and they also do <laughs> the best kebabs. <laughs> so I'm saying, black and white stripes, St James's Park, in the uh, in the Premier League, of course. Um, no, is, it, is, it, is the number nine shirt? It's not available though, is it? The number nine shirt. No, no, Callum Wilson's got that. He'll have to he'll have to earn that, mate. Go on. <laughs> but uh, no, listen, everyone's going to be in for him. Who, who do you, genuinely, you guys know know the inside on this? I'm just joking around. Um, but Carvey well, mentioned it. There, I would say Real Madrid. Real Madrid for you. I think Carver? Real Madrid they at the you. moment. But I wouldn't discount Manchester City uh, because of his father's connections yeah. with Manchester City as well. And also Pep Guardiola. It's difficult to say no to Pep Guardiola if he wants to sign you. And of course, if he was to move to Manchester City, he's guaranteed big, big trophies for a long time. But I just get the sense that could he be a player like Karim Benzema, who never plays in the Premier League? Although Benzema, I think Sir Alex Ferguson try to sign him at Manchester United mm. but could he be a player who doesn't end up ever playing in the Premier League it makes sense what you were saying about him sort of building a career maybe go to Spain next maybe end up in the Premier League after that because he's still so young you think of the great strikers R Brazilian Ronaldo he played he, he bossed it in Holland then he did it in Italy he did it in Spain you know he moved around Europe uh, you could see Haaland doing but the you, same you, you talk to a lot of players and players always say if Real Madrid want to sign you you can't say no yeah. How, how many players have said no to Real Madrid? If they make it clear that they want you, then it's difficult to say no to a club who've won 13 European Cups. Yeah, OK. Fascinating. Great question from Jan Algafjortov there. Though. I know you two both got Bugattis as well. I just wanted to know if you ate your kebabs in there as well. <laughs> if I had a Bugatti, I would definitely eat my kebab in the back of it. Exclusive. The sky sauce is on. Eat, you don't eat kebabs, do you? <laughs>
do deal with a little bit of the fallout of that things have happened since because uh, of course as we recorded we had some news drop um uh, but we also wanted to go into like an extended intro into what we are <laughs> what we are <laughs> what kind of monstrosities we are uh who we are and uh you know what we do uh, and how we got to where we are as well um for anyone that's kind of looking to to break into the industry we thought that'd be a really good chat so um but before we do that let's quickly t- check in on, on kind of last week's thing so um guys last week we dealt with activision blizzard being bought by microsoft we had a lot of thoughts uh a lot of them quite negative it would be fair to say um because we were worried about the you know the monopolization of the industry how are we feeling a week on um i mean the phil spencer tweet that came out what the the day after we recorded or, or no the, the the moment after we recorded wasn't it we literally finished recording and, and he sort of came out and said he'd had good calls with sony and confirmed their intent toward an existing agreement etc cetera, etc cetera. so i guess we have to take them at their, at their word how long that word will stand for i, I still have my suspicions but uh yeah it's, it sounds like good news so far i'm ever the optimist so um i'm not gonna go down the pessimistic route i just think yeah everything's gonna be great i hope <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's weird I, I think a lot of it came from people talking about call of duty and call of duty potentially being locked to xbox and pc and i think that's kind of a wild idea, uh, but it, I can see them doing something like where you can only play Warzone, like the free-to-play version on PlayStation or something, but if you want the annual release, you have to go to Xbox or something like that. I could see kind of something like that coming down the line, um, but for now, Call of Duty fans, you can still play on PlayStation. So that's, you know, I mean, do you really want to play Vanguard right now? Do you though? think it'll still yeah. be an annual release? I don't. I've seen some stuff that has suggested that there are conversations ongoing about no longer doing yearly releases um how true those leaks are and how advanced those talks are I- i'm not sure but that it sounds like it's something that they're at least starting to weigh up you know the, the possibilities of i think the the thing for microsoft now is that they can control that cadence because now they're not putting out halo infinite against vanguard you know like they did last last sort of q4 um they're not putting out you know if we, they could drop a call of duty in march for all we know you know like we see a more and more q1 q2 releases can you imagine like the annual call of duty franchise does drop but it's in like june and therefore there's no real competition for it and they get more people playing it because presumably it'd be on game pass eventually and that kind of stuff so i think there's um there's a lot they can do with it now and microsoft as we touched on last week now like owns the first person shooter market between halo call of duty doom uh overwatch quake you know all these franchises um so yeah i think i think that if they even if they don't go to annual i think uh, even if they take away the annual releases i think they'll still be they'll still be regular um but because i mean call of duty even on like a what you could argue vanguard's an off year i would argue vanguard is an off year um but it still makes money hand over fist so um but yeah, so we just kind of wanted to touch on that because <laughs> Phil Spencer, the absolute dick that he is, dropped that tweet like literally as we finished Could recording you believe last it? week. Honestly, um, we had them conversations. Yeah. We like, shall we cancel it or whatever? But as Ross pointed out, these things are going to happen, aren't they? So we can start to introduce more live kind of stuff maybe at some point. Who knows? Potentially. Yeah, and, and <laughs> yeah, and as 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 I kind of alluded to on the the Twitter at the moment, um, we are at Twitter on Glitch Slap Pod now. Uh, we can get Glitch Slap, which is annoying, um, but we will be kind of looking to perhaps do some live reactions, maybe some Twitter Spaces and that kind of stuff. There, I'll let, I'll I'll be led by you guys on that. Um, but yeah, so moving on anyway. So no, sorry, just just before kind of ha- before we move on, uh, yeah, while we're on. talking about uh, acquisitions and and corporate oh, monopolies yes. and and all of these sorts of things. Um, I know a lot of people who listen to this probably aren't huge esports fans, but I think it would be remiss to not mention the fact that uh, last night we got the news that both ESL and Face It have been bought by uh, a Saudi Arabian investment group <clears throat> for a combined total of $1.5 billion. Mm. Um, and, you know, the, the connotations that, that that holds, you know, when, for instance, ESL recently launched a GG for all. Um, uh, sort of uh, thing about about you know getting more women involved in gaming but also just generally speaking talking about inclusivity and then and then this news comes out you know a couple of weeks later about a country like Saudi Arabia that like their government you know their kings basically uh, funding some uh, funding such massive parts of our industry um, I think it is a bit of a sad day I think it's it's kind of 
evidence of sports washing coming into esports but i think we also probably need to take a step back and admit that this is something that's been going on for for a long time you know there's all the stuff going on with tencent and and all the atrocities that go on in china that that people sort of turn turn their eyes from and and there's various other things going on in esports and gaming it, it is it's sad um especially for people who've been involved in esports for a long time but it just feels like it's the direction we're going in now so i don't know if either you have any thoughts on that but i, I felt like i at least had to to mention it yeah we've had quite a few people come out against it um like i'm just looking at a tweet now from geo collins um so she's Rainbow Six Siege and Valorant caster, and she said, I too find it massively concerning that two of the biggest tournament organisers in esports have just been sold to a country whose laws punish LGBT people with death and keep women as second class citizens for an industry that prides itself on acceptance. What the fuck is this? And it's like, yeah, I mean, you can't really say any fairer than that, can you? She's completely summed it right. up. So no wonder people that are concerned. Um, I don't know. Do you, do you know what? You know, what, I, CS:GO is my game, right? I've got yeah. thousands of hours in, in Counter Strike in general. I've been following the scene for for years, and obviously ESL and Face It aren't exclusively uh, CS:GO, but it is the biggest esport that they, you know, they're involved in. Face It for their platform, and ESL for their events. Um, and and the idea that you know there there will be CS:GO pros who potentially, you know, are are gay or or you know, or on the, or on the LGBTQ spectrum in, in any way, the fact that some of them will now have to think to themselves, do I feel safe going to an event uh, in Saudi Arabia? Which will happen. Let's let's be honest, there will be events in Saudi Arabia. We saw the Neom deal that tried to happen in, in Blast, you know, a, a couple of years ago now. Um, I think that's that's a massive shame because, you know, like that person's tweet said, uh, esports prides itself on exclusive... On, <laughs> exclusivity? On inclusivity um, slip. and <laughs> 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 prides itself on inclusivity, uh, and you know, and I think generally speaking, does do a good job of it. And, and it's really it's sad to see that um, things like sports washing are able to, to happen in, in this industry that we're all so invested in. No, I agree. Yeah, I, I I kind of don't really have a huge follow up because you guys guys kind of nailed it. I'm. Of the three of us, I'm I'm the kind of outsider in terms of esports, but I think any time a, a platform such as esports is kind of taken on board by, you know, the the people in charge have these beliefs, have these you know, uh, these prejudices. I think is it's never good news for anyone. It's never good news for esports. It's never good news for anyone connected with esports. Um, you know, and and the the potential for I mean, just as you know, fr- from our point of view, like you know, are we really going to want to send a reporter, you know, to Saudi Arabia potentially to you know in these kind of circumstances it just you know it it, un- it unsettles me a little bit and as you guys say then there's the monopolization aspect yeah well. and and you know um, at the moment obviously everyone's saying that they're going to have complete editorial control over what they say and do but you know again much like the Microsoft deal that I said spoke about just now how how long does that last um and I just want to say uh and I, and I did mention this on my original tweet when I kind of talked about this uh community managers at ESL, just staff at general at ESL and face it, aren't the people to be blamed for this. You know, yeah. this is MTG in, in ESL's case, who sold ESL. You know, I, I, and I, I think it, it's unfair for anyone to go after me- staff members of any of these places who probably didn't even know it was coming until the day of. Um, and it's it's completely unfair to also expect people to take a stand and leave their jobs and, and leave themselves, you know, financially vulnerable or anything like that. Uh, I don't class myself as someone who, you know, takes you know goes to battle about about anything um in general so you know i'm not i'm not trying to sort of set myself up on a pedestal here and and say that i have any kind of moral uh you know that that i'm more moral than anyone else um i I just think it's it's something that that has to be we can't just ignore it right um and and i don't want to be a hypocrite either you know i enjoy f1 where there's saudi arabian money everywhere I enjoy football. I'm interested in seeing what's going on at Newcastle at the moment, who've just been invested in by the the, the Saudi Arabian government as well. So, uh, yeah, like I said, I'm not, I'm not trying to be a hypocrite. I just think it's it's something that obviously has to be discussed. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I think it's it's worth if worth mentioning, as you said, Ross. It's you know it was a big story this week to kick off the week as well. Really, that's two two weeks of acquisitions in a row now, um, and both of them kind of not you know with the activision blizzard kind of ongoing lawsuit it's that kind of like 
okay, this feels like huge money changing hands, but how does that change? Oh, you know the lives and the livelihoods of everyone beneath that. And, you know? and the guy who's um, running this this savvy gaming group or whatever it is, by the way, is a is a former Activision uh, VP of something or other. So you know, it's it's just it's it's endless, right? Absolutely endless. Yeah, it's 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 kind of scary, really, how how the industry is kind of it, it can pivot and it can flip based on you know money changing hands. It's it's a little bit a little bit worrying, but. Um, yeah, I kind of don't really know how to follow this conversation up now because it's so quite heavy stuff. And I was like, I've got in the notes here. It's like, let's talk about what we've been playing this week about video games and like, you know, fun stuff. But uh, I do think it's it's worth, you know, discussing that because it, as you said, Ross, it, you know, it, it's it's big and we can't just ignore it. Um, but going on to what we've been playing, Ross, you're still hanging out with Ezio. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm still living in 2009, 10, 11. Um, yeah, I haven't, to be honest, I haven't played many games uh, this week or, or had much time to play games this week. So I haven't got much further, I'm afraid. Fair play, fair play. Mel, what have you been playing? So I'm just checking on my Xbox app because I've not been playing much recently either. I'm like, <laughs> oh, what's the last thing I played? Apparently, last thing I played was Fortnite. So yeah, um, I've, yeah, there's been so much wow. news going on recently. Um, I just feel like I'm mentally drained. Do you know what I mean? So when it comes to like gaming and stuff, I'm like, oh no, I'd rather just watch a YouTube video or something and just zone out, not have to actually do anything. Do you know? What I, I get mean? that. Yeah, I mean, so side question then: if you if you if you're gonna zone out and play a game, like either of you, like Ross, I'm guessing your answer is probably gonna be Assassin's Creed too. <laughs> but you know, if 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 you were gonna zone out and play a game, what would what would it be? Like you just you just want to switch your brain off. I'll, I'll, what would you I'll pick? Think. It's not you. Just nah, wouldn't I'd, play I'd a game. Book. Oh, yeah, fair I'd, enough. I'd, I'd, oh, look oh, at no, you. Yeah. No, no, I just I I can't um no I can't I can't so because oh, every game I enjoy is quite <laughs> um or you know it's like <laughs> but you you don't play Counter Strike to zone out um I mean I guess you DM sometimes but no I, I don't I don't think there's any there's no game that I would kind of go back to all the time to sort of just just chill I don't think. For a while it was Skyrim. That's a solid shout, yeah. What about Hades, you? Hades, although it is just a nightmare over and over again, literally over and over and over again. Um, but also, actually, I have started playing Stardew Valley, and apparently that's quite like sweet and lovely and cute. Um, I'm, I'm about three hours in, to be fair. Yeah. So at the moment, I'm just trying to figure out how to grow sh- shit. <laughs> I don't really know what I'm doing. That really is the polar opposite yeah. of Hades as well. <laughs> Like those those two those two could not be further apart. Like one is literally about crawling out of hell, and one is about like making sure your tomatoes are watered or some shit. I don't know. I've never played Stardew Valley. Um, for me, for me, it's actually uh, I I just put FIFA career mode on, and I just sit there and just like play against the computer and, and win like nine times out of ten without breaking a sweat. It's not going to make me a better player, but it's just nice to just it's nice to win at something because everyone needs a little victory. Nice to get the dog. Actually, you say that. Have... Yeah. That that has reminded me. There there is a game that every now and then, if I'm like, I tell you, it's one of those games where if I'm sick, if it's a weekend, I'm feeling really unwell and I can't be bothered to do anything else. I'll just sit on Civ Six and basically play to the point where I realise I'm not going to win this game and then reload into another world or play the first like however many turns, realise I've got no good resources and restart another game. So yeah, Civ Six might fall into that category. Yeah, just a game you know you can win, or, or, not. <laughs> or if you're not going to win, you can just turn it off with no consequences. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for me this week, uh, going back to what we, we've been playing recently, um, I'm getting back into Destiny 2. Um, <laughs> if you do follow me on Twitter, you'll know that I talk about Destiny 2 a lot. I am uh, a bit of a saddo when it comes to Destiny 2, like hundreds and hundreds of hours, like actually, no, thousands of hours. Um, and so that's that's kind of like, I've been jumping back into that in advance of the new expansion next, next month. Um, and then I've also been playing Dying Light 2, uh, but that's kind of embargoed, so I can't actually say anything about that. Um, but uh, yeah, Ross, you've put on here. We can talk about the PlayStation Wrap, <laughs> and uh, I've not, I've not done it do yet. It, do it now. I know, Des- I know, Destiny will be top of mine. I want to know um, how many hours you play. But I dread to think. But I play across PlayStation and Go PC, on. and sometimes Xbox. So yeah, um, pull, pull your PlayStation um, Wrapped up. I can, I can take you all through mine if you like. Um, Ooh, yes, yeah, go on. Uh, go on. on. I, I don't know how to do it. How do I do it? So, uh, well, I've got the screenshots. So I played <clears throat> uh, 115 hours. Okay. Um, this is in 2021. So 115 hours total. Uh, four games. Um, 
those games were <laughs> Uncharted 2, Assassin's Creed 2, <laughs> Red Dead Redemption 2. There's a, there's a there's a two here uh, coming through. Um and uh and Crash Bandicoot. <laughs> Definite theme there. Yeah. That's a lot uh, more. I'm I was just trying to I find mine at the moment. Have. Mel it, 115 total in 2020. Do you play PlayStation? Yeah, I would have played less than that. I literally the only time I touched my PlayStation last year, as I said last time, was for God of War and Ratchet and Clank, and that's it. You have an Xbox, though, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> that's my new baby. I love it. Yeah. It, I, Mike, I Microsoft, can't... if you if you want to throw some more money around, uh, send me that. <laughs> 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 I think it's the least they could do after Big Phil completely like shit us up with his tweet <laughs> last week. I don't think I, I think they should look at that and go, do you know what we did? We did kind we did of them dirty. Uh, hit him with that. <laughs> yeah, that's not fair. Let's send it. Let's send them all to the Xbox. Um, I can't get on PlayStation Wrapped. I'm sorry. I will find it and I will try and tweet it if I remember. <laughs> but um, I I can I can get I can probably guess the top three were Returnal, uh, probably Deathloop. And uh, maybe Ratchet and Clank, but Destiny is actually. I've Destiny got Ratchet and Clank now, so I'll, I'll play that at some point. Yeah, probably in like ten years' time. Yeah. yeah have you got the most recent Ratchet and Clank, <laughs> or is it one from ten years ago? Which one are you going? No, for? I think it's. I think it's I'm pretty PS, sure it's a new one. Is this a PS2? <laughs> one? I'm pretty sure it's a new one. <laughs> is it Rift Apart? Or Saying is it that, I, clean, I cleaned out my um, I cleaned out my old room at my mum's house and found my Xbox 360 in a drawer that I didn't know was still there, and then all my Xbox 360 games. And I actually did obviously play quite a lot of Xbox 360 because I had about. 200 games so uh, wow yeah you put like a million hours into modern warfare 3 uh i think because you could see on the start menu for modern warfare 3 before you went actually properly into multiplayer you could see how many days you played and i think it was like 35 uh on modern warfare 3 so that's, that's over a month yeah, yeah. over a month for yeah. us um yeah so kind of on the subject of of our memories and our kind of paths you know, to get to where we are today recording this podcast. Um, kind of wanted to touch upon uh, an idea Mel had for, you know, how we got to where we are, our industry journeys. And I think, Mel, it sort of spawned by a tweet, wasn't it, you saw on Yeah, on so one of my good friends, Lara, um, she posted about um, what degree did you have, and or if any, and has it helped you in your career so far? And it, it went pretty viral, to be honest. Everyone was saying, like, whether or not it helped them. Um, and I thought it was a really interesting conversation to have. So shout out Laura Jackson. Shout out Laura. <laughs> I hope she's following us on Twitter. I hope she listens to the podcast. <laughs> otherwise, a shout, uh, otherwise, it's like shout yeah. to a pillow, isn't it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, you, you go first then, Mel. So so how did you become editor-in-chief of GG Recall? So um, I always wanted to be a journalist. I started the school newspaper when I was in primary school and I made myself editor, obviously. Um, and then from there, I just tried to get into the newspapers and everything as much as I could. I, I just liked the idea of having my name on something where my face wasn't attached to it. Um, so, and I love writing. I, I, lo I love, yeah. I, I can relate to <laughs> um, And I loved writing it and I loved like just expressing myself through words. So, and I'm nosy, I'm a nosy cow. So that also helps, um, wanted to be a journalist. And so from that point, um, I did like all my GCSEs and stuff with that in mind. And then life got in the way, unfortunately I ended up running away from home. Um, so I ended up not going to sixth form anymore. I had to drop out because I couldn't afford the bus to get to sixth form. I ended up dropping out and I went to college instead where I did performing arts because I could walk to that college. I couldn't walk to sixth form. So from that point, I got all the points I needed to be able to go and do journalism at Staffordshire University. Uh, shout out Staffs, who now actually do an esports course, which is a bit controversial, but that's beside the point. So yeah, I went to university, studied journalism, and yeah, just really started freelancing as soon as I could. My actual career started in writing guides for, um, not guides, yeah, guides, guides for funerals um, and celebrity obituaries, and <laughs> it's just very sorry 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 guides for funerals so like, like what? repatriation like... so say if you die abroad <laughs> oh okay i i had this i had this image of like how to unlock this funeral <laughs> like <laughs> not quite how how to how to get this burial well, plot. no i did I write like... about burial plots and eco burials and stuff but yeah so it was very i'm a goth aren't i so it kind of fit in um so yeah i did <laughs> ross can you make a note ross can you make a note for our seo stuff for this? <laughs> what, what is the search volume for 
funeral guides. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I wrote loads of celebrity obituaries. Wow. Margaret Thatcher, pretty much everyone going. I wrote about them and their lives. Um, I it, it was against my will a little bit with the Margaret Thatcher one, but anyway. Um, so yeah, from there I did things like got involved with BBC. Um, in the while I was in uni. Um, with their generation project, so it was the lead up to the general election. I was very into politics at the time. Uh, I had a, a blog on Huffington Post regarding politics um, and then the generation thing, I was on TV, radio, um, and I wrote for them and stuff as well about young people and politics. From there, I wrote for like the drum and things like that. And then Lab Bible came a knock in. So I went in, in and had an interview with them and I was the first female full-time journalist at Lab Bible. Um, I got shit tons of hate because they all thought that I was changing everything, but really I was just a journalist. Um, and then from there I started writing all of the gaming content because I wanted to. I was trying to prove that Gaming Bible could be its own website, which it now is. Um, and yeah, so really things kind of spiraled from there. I ended up leaving Lab Bible, went over to Social Chain, um, and where I ran like game by student problems and helped with the sport as well for their editorial. And then GG Recon got in touch. Um, they'd seen what I'd done at multiple places and then ended up in esports. Honestly, I didn't know that much about esports before I got into GG Recon. I knew about gaming, um, but esports was completely new to me. All I knew is that there's not many women who are editors in um, esports journalism. I think I might actually be the only woman editor-in-chief of an esports publication which is a bit sad really i mean if i'm wrong please let me know because i want to speak to you um but yeah so it's really strange how i got here but i've just kind of been involved in so many different pockets of journalism but i think gaming and esports that's really been the most fun that was a long wow. spiel <laughs> I, I genuinely that i no no this is this is what the podcast's about this week is like introducing ourselves and where we came from and that because we kind of didn't get the chance to do that last week and that, that was a I was like, that was a hell of a journey. Like that was, that was great though. And I, I just don't know how really how to follow that up with like, I mean, I, I just got lucky. I, <laughs> Ross, your story. <laughs> go on, Lloyd. You go first. Yeah, I want to hear yours. I, I mean, I'll go first. Yeah. So I um, I had no interest in journalism. Uh, no interest in. I, I enjoyed writing, but I didn't know what I wanted to write about. But I've always been into video games. Um, went to went to school. Went to sick form. Didn't go to uni. So that crosses the degree part of that out um and then i was i was working for the local council i was working in uh in um uh, enforcement so basically if someone was having a noisy party i'm the kind of person that would well I, not, i'm the kind of person it was my job to knock on the door and be like can you turn it down please um, <laughs> on behalf of the council um and that was kind of uh, a bit of a pain um and i kind of can you guys hear me okay still Okay, cool. <laughs> I can see Mel saying something, and but she's on mute. Um, and then yeah, and then so I, I had been sort of writing a blog, like just basically like this is my life, and you know these are the kind of things I want to do because I wanted to do something creative outside of like making music. And then uh, it was my partner now, like Frankie. She was just like, you should approach some sites about this, like because your writing's good. And I, like, I was doing blog reviews, like I was I was going out buying a game, reviewing it, like six months late, but just because I wanted to write about it. Um, I was I was going into I was going into a phone shop. Do you remember phones for you and that? I was going in there, being like, "Oh yeah, can I have a look at this phone, please?" Looking around and like making notes and doing a tech review when I got home, <laughs> like without that buying the so phone. That is so sweet. Because <laughs> um, I just really because it, it it dawned on me that like I really knew that I'd have to kind of like hustle a little bit, like to try try and kind of like get some content to kind of like put put together and. Um, and I was really lucky that a couple of sites took me on, like writing for free, like hobbyist sites. Um, and then a um, friend of the show, James Wright, took me on at Daily Star. And he was like, I can't pay you, but I can give you like a platform to write like reviews and stuff. And we're Metacritic certified. And I remember that being like the coolest shit. Um, and then so from there went to um, actually left my job. So I left left my job at the council uh, when my boy was three months old. So that was quite scary and kind of moved to reach which is the uk's largest publisher so daily express daily mirror daily star um and then it didn't work out for me like within five months i was just like i hate this and i'm not it's not clicking with me um and so i was like i'm gonna just go freelance like i built up a solid list of freelance clients um and then thankfully <laughs> the next week gfinity were like oh hey you still available i was like okay cool so like um with gfinity for a year and a half or so um really love my time there really love the team that we built there 
um but then kind of like had a chance conversation with ross last year and was like hey like you got anything at deserto sort of thing like i actually it was probably along the lines of have you got anything at dexerto because i don't know how to pronounce it because it's a strange name <laughs> and um and he was he was like maybe so uh yeah long story short here i am games editor at deserto no degree um just a lot of experience writing and just learning from people around me and and like you know learning so much on the team we've got now it's just like insane but yeah and then i can't wait to hear how ross explains how he became my boss <laughs> um bit of a weird one uh have got a degree but i'll go into why i think it's useless in a minute um so i never really thought i was going to do any writing or anything like that i just really enjoyed esports um I played like tactical ops, a game called tactical ops, and then got into Counter Strike. Watched like I'd stay up and watch Counter Strike tournaments till stupid o'clock when I was a kid. Um, but you know, played uh, Call of Duty quite uh, quite a lot. Uh, played Deserto when Deserto was a forum um, for, with with its own Deserto rule set for the Call of Duty game. So was always very involved in the the uh, c- like competing side of esports uh, at a low level. Um, but never really thought I'd do anything beyond that. <clears throat> um, and then uh, my partner at the, at the time decided she was going to go to uni. I was working at home base as a warehouse manager, like just hating life. Um, and I was like, ah, oh, do you know what? I'll just, I'll, I'll apply to the uni and see, see what, if, if they've got anything in history, because that's what I was best at, that sixth form. Um, and they, they were like, yeah, we, you know, we can give you a spot. Well, we can give you a spot on this on this course, uh, doing doing a history degree. I was like, cool. So moved up to Bristol, um, and was there, and I was quite bored. Didn't particularly enjoy the degree, um, and I was still sort of following esports quite closely. And then one evening, uh, the news came out that a guy called Kaylee or, or Callie uh, uh, had been banned from from Counter Strike, Zach banned, which was like this huge news. Uh, he had been caught cheating. It was this massive drama and I just happened to be up sitting in my dingy little uh, university flat and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to stick a camera on and, and record my thoughts um, and recorded them, put them on YouTube, didn't do any editing, had no idea what I was doing. The whole the video was like awful lighting, um, lots of arms like that uh, and, and just uploaded it and it because it was such a huge story, like the first video I uploaded got like, 10k views and I was thinking and then I kind of sat back and I thought, oh, this is interesting. Um, and then from there, I just started uploading a few a few videos, uh, just covering CS:GO news. I, I leaked that Hiko was um, leaving one of his teams, uh, which got me a lot of hate until I proved until I got proven right. Um, that got a lot of views. Uh, and then and then sort of generally, generally, then over the next sort of few months, I started uploading some videos. Some of them did well. Some of them did absolutely awful because I didn't have any kind of strategy. I just wanted to talk about Counter Strike. Uh, and then I got approached by a guy that was sort of just starting to write his own website called 27 in one we started working together did some interviews did some breaking news on 27 in one then he kind of drifted away and i got approached by a place called leap mag that was run by alan media which is a danish um media company they said they wanted me to run their counter-strike and cod news so i was like yeah cool i'll do that all alongside uni and started basically working full time and just never going to university um and and covering all their csgo news interviewed zonic which was like really cool for me at the time he was one of my heroes from back in the day in in 1.6 um interviewed carrigan uh and and that kind of carried on for about a year went out off to eswc for call of duty bumped into a guy called mike kent and a guy called josh nino who would end up being my bosses a few years later um Never heard of it. Never heard of it. <laughs> uh, and and then yeah, so I, I worked with them for about a year. Then they kind of went defunct, you know, out of nowhere. Hey, we're closing down like now. Lost all my work, all just all, you know, all gone. Oh my god. Um, and at, at that point, I was like, shit, what am I gonna do? Uh, Mike Kent from from Deserto again. You know, he he kind of got in contact with me and said, look, if you want to do some work alongside a uni degree, you know, we we could do that. So I was actually working with Deserto for about I don't know six months, um, and then maybe a bit less than that and then actually i was just going into my last year of university and i got i got really sick i had um really bad glandular fever with with loads of uh complications like uh, viral hepatitis jaundice um really really touch and go hospitalized for a little while i had the same um so did you <laughs> yeah, so uh so yeah <laughs> so so basically what happened is i had to stop working uh and i also got basically couldn't go to university i already hadn't been going to university to be honest i was 
living in Cornwall and just driving up to uni once a week and doing one day of uni and then coming home. Uh, but once the Gandra fever was there, that that sort of um, really hurt me with that. So I ended up do, doing my degree, finishing it, got got two one I think. Um, but I've never used it again. Never never went and got my you know never went to my graduation or anything like that. Uh, but also because of that, I'd had to stop working. Uh, and then I spent about two years. Um, laboring uh working in factories uh working in an aerospace factory um because i kind of was like i'd stopped doing all my videos i wasn't doing anything like that anymore I'd, I'd basically stopped doing that when i started writing um and i was you know i was kind of i thought to myself like it, that kind of pipe dream's done now I'd, i've had one company you know go bust to me i've had another company where i just disappeared on them because of being so sick uh and i was working in an aerospace factory uh building air filters for for airplanes <laughs> um and one day this this message came across on Twitter from from Mike Kent going, uh, "Are you alive?" <laughs> with a question mark, and I was like, "Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm better now." And he goes, "Do you want to come back?" And I was like, "What? Well, seriously?" Uh, and that that was basically um, hit them saying, "Look, we we're expanding. We you know we really like working with you before. Um, so if you want the job, you can take you can have it." And at the time, it was quite a big decision for me because it was going from something that was very stable although absolutely mind-numbingly boring um and and quite good financially uh to, to take a big risk on esports and i ummed and about it and i thought you know what this is the only thing i've ever felt passionate about so yeah i, I went for it and i, I came in as a, as a junior writer for, for the certo and then over the years i've i've sort of worked my way up to, to where i am now but yeah it was a a very odd thing because i never really made the conscious decision i want to be a journalist i want to do esports i want to do games news uh, it kind of all just happened. It's a bit of a weird one. So yeah, very long story. I'm, I apologise. So that's interesting. No, no, no. As I say, it's... I was no, going to say on, that Lloyd, you came into it through a passion from gaming. I came into it for a passion through journalism and Ross, you came into it from a passion of esports. Like, isn't that quite interesting <laughs> that all yeah. three of us had different passion points, but it's all contributed to us being here right now. That's, yeah. It's probably worth noting as well, none of us got into this for the money. <laughs> <laughs> no one gets into journalism and there's a very <laughs> good reason for that <laughs> none of us got in, into it for free shit and money like uh, that that's very I've telling never, i've never had any free shit from this job <laughs> <laughs> but as well i think advice for people who want to get to into like positions like we're in i think there is it, i hate to say it but for me it was right in places for free and Lloyd I know you've said a little bit about that as well and I know Hitmarker yeah. and, and places like that have taken these kind of jobs off um, their platforms so that people can't see them on there but I do think that if you've not got connections in the industry already writing for free I hate to say it it's shit and it shouldn't be like that but for people like me from disadvantaged background or whatever you want to say like that was fundamental for me getting to where I am now yeah, I mean, look, it's the same for me, right? I was just uploading videos because I enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I say this to almost anyone that ever reaches out to me about, about work is, you know, don't put yourself in a situation where you're, you're going to be struggling financially. Um, but you can create content. You can create, you can build your own brand. You can be a reply guy on Twitter and build a, gr a brand. You can upload shorts on YouTube. You can do longer videos on YouTube. You can write a blog like, like Lloyd was doing on your own. But, but creating content you, you what you shouldn't do is just wait for something to, to sort of fall in your lap um i would say if you're going to work for free maybe work for yourself for free um because you know it then no one no one's necessarily profiting but also if there are if there are opportunities out there for you to get experience that's valuable where you're getting something in return uh i don't see massive issues there i, I i'm not a fan of people working for free i have to admit but there are times where you know that i know a guy that, that went off and just work work uh did some event stuff for the certo and then ended up going and working for hex at, at the hex quarters in, in texas um so you know the, these things do happen if, if you're willing to sort of uh do a little bit of extra work i'm sure it's worth yeah following from what russ said i would say like if, if you're writing for free just write for you mm -hmm. don't write for don't follow deadlines like <clears throat> there are sites out there that will pay you a pittance and they'll say you can't write for mm -hmm. other sites like fuck that noise like that's not cool like find find if you find an editor that you click with and that you're happy to work for free with and they they make sure that up front it's free but you know maybe they can introduce you to some pr or some agency people or you know some other sites that's different 
But as soon as you start doing it on someone else's time, as soon as you start thinking, shit, I'm late for mm. work, like, but you're not getting paid for it or you're getting paid like peanuts, like just stop. Um, and like we get, I'm sure, uh, well, I, I know I do. I'm sure you guys get it all the time. Like, how can I break into the industry? How can I break into the industry? As Ross said, there's so many avenues out there now, whether you're, you want to do video, whether you want to do a podcast like this one, whether you want to, you know, whatever you want to do, there's, there's an option for you. But if you're going to do it for free, do it for you. Like, do not, whatever you do put your time and money into making someone else money when you're yeah. not getting I think the the, the right. caveat there is is if they're you know if it's a if it's a project with someone where you're just both doing it like like me 27 and 1 none of us were making money it was just something fun we all wanted to do uh, or if you're doing something where they're for, it's because it's for a good cause or something like that you know there are caveats um but yeah if if you're working for a company that you damn well know is making a profit they can afford to pay you yeah um, but there also a shout out as well to different schemes that there are available. So I took part in a scheme with Sky News called the Diversity Scheme, I think it was called. And I had to go through like I was like applying for a job and they paid for my, um, like for me to like st- accommodation, couldn't get the word out then. They paid for my accommodation, they paid for food for me, they did all this for me the whole time I was there. And it was a brilliant, like I got to learn so much while I was there, but I wasn't getting paid, but I was getting experience and it was a placement. So things like that are great. And we have a couple of people at our place through the kickstart scheme through the government. I do think that's coming to an end at some point this year, unfortunately, but giving people who are on universal credit a step into the, um, into this industry, but also getting paid for it. And I think that that was great. And I would have loved to get more people on that. And I would have loved to have done that myself when I was on benefits. Um, so I don't ever want to tell someone don't do this because it could stop the, it leading like onto the next thing. Does that make sense? But here like at GGBCom, we always pay. Um, and I, that, I don't care what experience you have as long as you've got passion and knowledge about esports or gaming, I don't care. Um, but when you you need if you've had all these disadvantages in life you need to take hold of every advantage you can so i'm so morally split on it because i wouldn't be yeah. where i am without it but well, also i think it's a shitty thing to make people do stuff I think, for free i think like you said there though it, you are getting something in return right you are and and sometimes what you get in return is experience i i that is definitely something you know that, that people are willing to do and and uh, internships and stuff like that people have built their careers off that especially for, for like you said i mean i i'm the same right i i couldn't afford to do anything I, I don't come from a family that has any money and i definitely didn't have any money after i left uni and realized that my history degree wasn't going to get me any kind of job at all um so yeah you know i i was willing to to do things for myself for fun but i was also you know working alongside that i, I think it is it's, it's a really weird one uh morally I, I, like you say some people are in a position to do it but i just yeah it, I, if someone's making money off the content you're doing, I think at that point, you know. I suppose it's, it's probably also worth pointing out that like all three of us, we got into this industry, but we all did different things first, you know, and we all kind of fell into it in our own way, you know, grafted for it in our own way, but none of us kind of left school thinking like, all right, Mel started a school newspaper. That's <laughs> but, you know, we, we all, we, we all, Mel put herself top of the pile at the school newspaper. Right? She's, she's been destined for this. All right. But the rest of us, us mere mortals like me and Ross, you know, we, we kind of fell into this. Um, and, you know, we, from sounds of things, we all had different jobs while we were working towards this as well. You know, we were all trying to make, make ends meet. Um, and, you know, there's no way that I could have, left say my job at reach which admittedly was probably coming to an end anyway um and and jump straight into freelancing if i didn't have something like gfinity where it was like a monthly client that i knew it was going to pay the bills and anything else on top of that was a bonus um so what i would say is like if you're if you're already in a job and you think you know i'd really love to write about games write write about games but do it in like your evenings or whenever you've got the time you know don't jump straight in because like that is the most terrifying thing and um it's so hard to to verbalize that because it, it's not it's not a knock on your quality it's not a knock on your um your your work ethic it's literally just like if you jump and there's no freelance work there because you know we're just coming out of a pandemic and that kind of stuff like you just you know you, you you're going back hat in hand and you're and then you've got to try and explain to your loved ones that like and and i've had to have that conversation like when i was trying to get into the industry like 
do I really want to make this move? And, and you know, my partner quite rightly being like, is this the move for us? You know, do we, you know, she's very supportive, but at the same time, like, I, as I say, I left my job at the council where I probably could have stayed till mm. I was 65 and retired. Exactly the same for me. To jump to, to jump to a job that lasted five months. Mm. Like, and I had a three month old at home. Like it's, it's, it's a nightmare. It really is like as, as finding most jobs, most jobs are, but it's just, you know, be, if, if you're going to take that step, if you're going to, push everything to the side and be like okay i want to write about games i want to be involved in games somehow like be prepared to kind of have those hard dis- discussions with yourself and your love and if you're and passionate enough you know. about something like that you'll, you'll find a way of, of making it work i mean one of the first things that i'll say to someone when they when they message me um about wanting a job or, or being interested in getting into the industry and being really passionate I, i'll say to them let's look, send me some portfolio like send, send me some of your work whether that's on other websites whether that's blogs whether that's you know things you've written on you know tweet longers that you've done um and and a lot of the time people haven't done anything and that's when you, you know for me at least i, I kind of question well you know great for you, great you yeah sure great you for you this? for reaching out but you've never created any content you've never written anything even even for yourself for fun um is this really something you want to do because trust me it, it can look i'm sure a lot of people look at games journalism and think oh that's so cool you get to write about video games you get to play video games um <clears throat> you get free stuff like i said i've never had any free stuff <laughs> Um, but but honestly, uh, I I was writing like eight or nine, ten sometimes articles a day, um, often about things I wasn't interested in uh, for for a long time. So it's not it's not necessarily always um, the way it looks like uh, on Twitter. No, that's true. Yeah, and uh, just before Mel jumps in, just like catching on to what Ross said at the end there, like. The people that kind of like jump in your DMs and like, why the fuck did you give this such a shit school? Blah, 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 blah. Like, if you want to try it, fucking yes. go for it. Like, <laughs> I, start, I started a blog and it turns out, I, you know, I had at least a passable degree of talent and, it, you know, it's got me this far. Like, you think you can do better? I will read it. I will sit there and I'll read it. And if there's if it's good, I'll ask Ross if we can hire you. <laughs> but, but <Hello>. like... It, it, <laughs> <laughs> but you've got you've got to remember like when when you get these people in your dms and like people kind of like brush it off but like we are putting content out there because we enjoy it and because we are proud of that content like and it's worth remembering that like there are people that just exist to tear that down and there is definitely a sort of mental fortitude required to kind of deal with that on a day-to-day because it's the internet your opinion is always yeah, week, week one i had a cod pro yeah week one in my job i had a cod pro like say something and just like 50 60 people just started coming at me on twitter and i was like whoa so yeah it's it's that's definitely something um you know i mean i, I know mel's mel's got us both beat there she's she's shared some absolute crackers on twitter uh over the last few months so. yeah i mean we, we've got it lucky we're two white blokes like come on mel so what's it like <laughs> i the, i could speak about trolls all day so i used to get like multiple messages per day maybe 10 20 per day of just men and it was always men um really just giving me shit for writing for the lab bible because it was the lab bible why are you writing for it you're a girl do you know what i mean this is the kind of mindset they had although i'll quickly say i started just asking them how they were because at first i would like send funny things back and i never tell them to fuck off or whatever but i started asking how they were and several times i i found out that they were going through awful horrible things at home um and they were deeply deeply sad people and me just asking genuinely how are you like what's wrong at the end of the day i'm not here to be someone's therapist i'm not here to be a troll's therapist but just finding out why they are the way they are makes it so much easier to handle because happy people aren't sliding into your dms to give you shit do you know what i mean it's that's not something that people who are content in life will do but i actually made friends with a few of the trolls i actually did (laughs) and we ended up being and they'd be like oh mel i'm so sorry i ever spoke to you like that and i'd be like it's fine. I, I made haters into friends. I made them into fans. A lot, a lot of people, um, <laughs> a, a lot of people don't forget that that there are other people on the end of that yeah. stuff, right? When they when they say things on Twitter or, or Facebook or anything like that, you know, they they do forget that we're people too. They'd be like, "Oh, I didn't think you'd reply. Why send it then? Like, I'm like, you're not just shouting into the void. Like, you shout into." I must someone. say, you're a much better person than me. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. I found it really interesting because why? Like, I would never in a million years think of doing something like that. So actually getting into the mind of someone who does 
it was fascinating but we could honestly do a whole podcast as, as a this. sports fan there have been a few times where i've where i've very nearly sent things <laughs> to, to, <laughs> to people who've written things or or said you know said things on broadcast and i thought no no just don't do it but yeah i'm sure there are tweets from like years ago where i've where i've moaned about some football pundit or something and i think uh, you definitely get some new perspective when you're on the other end of it absolutely Hang on, I'm hearing now. Yes, uh, Ross will be cancelled as of next week. So, I mean, I've, uh, I've already, you... <laughs> I've already dared to speak about the, uh, the the ESL acquisition. I'm sure I've said something wrong during all of that. So. Before before we kind of sum up, is there anything you know you guys have, you know, like a, like a quick kind of like couple of tips you can give? Because for me, it's just like it's really simple. It's just like like Ross said, just build a portfolio. Whether that's you writing on literally a notepad and you just taking a picture of it and sending it to me showing that you can format a structure a sentence you know put an article together show critical thinking anything like that you know um i'll, I'll read it like i i <laughs> i can't hire you <laughs> ross might but i can't um but i will always read stuff that's sent to me like i you know i i, I enjoy reading other people's writing you know um and not just because i've, I've had a rough day and like ross i want to read a book because because he's very high and mighty like that. Why, why am I getting attacked for reading books? <laughs> I'm actually, I'm actually sat here nerding out right now because they're doing a Percy Jackson show on uh, Disney Plus. Oh. But yeah, any any kind of advice from you guys, like summing up? Like I said, just just create some stuff for yourself, uh, or just do do what, do what you enjoy. Um, if you if you genuinely enjoy something, your passion will usually mean that you become good at it. Um, I, I'm not a massive believer in. I mean, that, you know, there are people who are natural talents, but generally speaking. Um, if if you really want to, to get into this industry, it's still at a stage where you you will find a way. Um, but just don't one one thing that I, I've interviewed a lot of people. Um, don't have such a high opinion of yourself that you're unwilling to bend in order to get to where you need to go. Eventually, you know we we've all done it. We've all. Um, I mean, I was writing Jake Paul articles like day one. I thought I was a CS:GO writer, and I was I was writing about Jake Paul. Um, but you know that, and also don't just be aware of how much a journalist makes <laughs> because sometimes uh you know pe- people have very high expectations yeah get off your ivory tower <laughs> my advice would be um gaming and esports specifically remember how small the community is um and like i'm not saying be nice to everyone but being nice has got me quite far um but don't be a dick like that's the Modesty. main yeah <laughs> But, don't, <laughs> but just don't be a dick I think is the main thing like people talk to each other and I've seen people talking about people and stuff and like it, I don't know you don't want to so someone you're slagging off this week might be somebody who's about to employ you in, in a year's time absolutely um, and you know, obviously call that's... out shitty behavior that's completely fine but don't just be a dick for the sake of being a dick like there's, there's too many egos already so don't <laughs> you know i'm kind of tacking on to what you said also reach out to people like the amount of people that i've had dming me and asking for advice i love to give advice like especially women in esports women in gaming i'm like yeah talk to me let's like you know let's talk about this so um i think you'd be surprised how receptive people are and how much people would like to actually give advice so i would definitely do that and yeah just write just write and learn and please learn what defamation is that's also important and apostrophes yeah. just learn that uh, make yeah, and make sure that you put a hyphen between the E and the S when you're writing esports. Is this going to come up every time? I quit. <laughs> <laughs> She's gone. We lasted two episodes. That's it. To be fair, I think I think like that that last bit that you sort of mentioned there, Mel, like about you know apostrophes and that kind of stuff. Like that, there, there is no substitute for a good editor. Like and and th- but you also need to take that on. And um, you know, I know for a fact I was getting apostrophes wrong for ages. And I'm so glad someone told me when they did, because like when I was doing it for the hobbyist sites, it wasn't really picked up because it was just like, hey, you've submitted your story, we put it online, um, and then find it. And it kind of, you have to kind of break those bones to reset them uh, and, and make those good habits. But it's it's well worth doing. Yeah, yeah no one's an amazing journalist um, straight off. So be receptive to feedback and criticism because if you get your back up every time someone points out a mistake, you're not going to last very long. Um, you you just need to be constantly adapting and willing to get better. That's what I'd say. Practice is yeah. Practice is everything, right? I mean, I I haven't really written now for like two years, and I know for a fact if I had to go in and write an arg- an article or a, an interview or something like that, I I'd, I'd really really struggle because you know once you fall out of practice, it's it's really hard to get it back, get the flow back. Yeah. 
Yeah, so there you have it. The uh, the glitch slap team's tips on getting into the industry and how we got into the industry as well, which I think is um, it's quite a fun story in itself and a little bit of an introduction to who we are because we kind of missed that last week. Um, but we did kind of want to do one last thing on the show um, and we kind of wanted to make this a regular segment. So this is the uh, the Ross Deason roving reporter yes! <laughs> segment where Ross, who has not played a game in about 10 years, that's that's obviously <laughs> hyperbole he has. Otherwise, it would be, re- be really awkward him sitting here and going, God, what? <laughs> I actually um, haven't played God of War. But <laughs> he actually hasn't got there. But funny enough, we'll get to that in a moment. So uh, if you follow us on Twitter, you'll notice that we asked for, we solicited some sort of game suggestions. What What's Ross missed out on? What can, what can we kind of fill his memory in with? So my idea was like originally that we'd get him to play like one a week. I don't know if we'll get, we'll get to do one a week unless they're on Game Pass because we, we don't have a budget yet. We're just, a, we're just three people with a podcast. But... Let's see how it goes. So we got quite a few suggestions. So what I'd like to do, guys, I'd like to get your idea on this. So we're, this is like very kind of like how the sausage is made at the moment. I've got this list of games here. Do you want me to run through the list before I hit shuffle? Or do you want me to just hit shuffle and then we can reshuffle it next week if we don't get as many suggestions? Whatever. You can take Super Mario World out right now, though, because I don't own anything Nintendo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. So let's just let's just run through the list. So... The list is, at, at the moment, <clears throat> Super Mario World, Hades, Batman Arkham City, Dishonored, Portal 2, which came from Mel. So I f- feel like that's got to be on there, you know, quite high up the list, really, isn't it? Um, God of War, Hitman 2016, because I'm not making you play the whole trilogy in a week. <laughs> you won't speak to me again. <laughs> Skate 3, Lake, Knack, and Titanfall 2. So, uh... Shall I, shall I hit the spin? Oh, yeah, but take Super it. Mario World out because I, ge- I genuinely I, I have no way of playing that game. <laughs> so. so, Ross, your game to play this week is... Oh, Skate 3. What do you like with skating? <laughs> I mean, I, I skated when I was like 12. I could drop in and I, could, I think I could do a kickflip. I think that was about it. Uh, I played, oh, well, I played there we uh, go. Tony Hawk Underground. So you're oh, going to be fine. Classic, yeah. like, this is so... Yeah, you'll be fine. I mean, this is a completely different franchise and system, but you'll be fine. Um, well, is it on PS4? Um, so that was that was actually recommended by Sam from Deserto. That's so uh, shout out to Can Sam. Play that on PS4. Um, uh, let's hope so. If oh well, yeah, it might not be on PC. I tell you what, we'll do it, just in case. We would do another spin just in case you can't get Skate Free on your platform of choice. Is that fair? Uh-huh. So it, it, uh, yeah. You sound thrilled. You can't. It's only on Skate 3. I, I, it's, I'm really surprised. It's only on PS3. I'm just Googling it here. You actually can't play it on the oh, okay. thingy. So. Sorry, okay, Sam. Well, you've, instead, you've got one of my favourite games of all time, which is Batman Arkham City. Cool. I can play that. Can't so, I? yeah. That's on, like, everything, I think. So, cool. yeah. You should be yeah, so, I think we just I think we well. just re-roll after I've actually cool. given that game a, a playthrough, right? Cool. I mean, it's come out in 2011, okay. which is a good year for gaming, uh, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah. Any, was, anything after that yeah, is just it was a, good uh, year. a bit new and confusing. A bit too recent. Confusing. Yeah. Um, so next week we will check in on you and see how you're doing with saving Arkham City because I, I think that is probably the best one in the franchise. So no, I played, played Arkham Asylum, not Arkham City. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. Man. So. So I'm, I'm going to be more educated I'm sorry, than you. I'm sorry, Ross. <laughs> Ross, who is still playing Assassin's Creed 2, is stunned that Mel hasn't played Arkham City. Oh, wow. Okay. It's going to be like that, is it? Um, but, <laughs> yeah, so... Um, so, yeah, Ross, you got you got to get on and uh, get, your, get your Cape Crusader on. You dark oh, the, the Arkham Collection at 50 quid. Jesus, the things I do for content. No, nah, no, nah, we, we, we can get it. Yeah, do pay that, 50 I'm sure. quid. I'm sure. We'll get... Can't, can't we just get it on PC for you? It's on Steam for like it's probably like two quid on Steam. Oh, can I put it on Steam? Sweet. Yeah, almost certainly. Cool. But uh, yeah, right before we <laughs> before we go to discussing our pocket money, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, thank you both so much for joining me. So as as we mentioned, this is the Glitch Lab podcast. We had originally planned to do this every other week, and then we enjoyed doing this last week so much that we uh, <laughs> we ended up it's been doing a lot of one, news so. too. Well, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it has, yeah. And and I think also like we knew we wanted to do this kind of introduction thing, didn't mm-hmm. we? So it's kind of like we, we kinda of had the episode ready, so it was just kind of filling in the gaps with the whole Activision stuff. But um yeah, thank you so much for joining us everyone. And um yeah, I'll, hopefully we'll see you either next week or the week after. We kind of haven't sorted that out ourselves yet, but um at the rate that you know we're going, then <laughs> hopefully next week already. But uh yeah, thank you so much. So uh, over to you, Mel 
and and Ross. Thank you for tuning in, and yeah, we really appreciate all the support. So uh, obviously, we just wanted to do this as three mates just having a laugh, but yeah, actually having people listen is amazing. So please do keep tuning in. Yeah, thanks everyone, and yeah, please don't cancel me. <laughs> tell, I'm telling you, mate, the anime the anime profile pictures are coming. Oh for god, you you're gonna get cancelled. You're the one who's getting cancelled now. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Socks are the number one most requested item in homeless shelters. Underwear is the second, shirts are third. At Bombas, socks were first. Made with comfortable details for everyday wearing. Then underwear and shirts too, all designed to perfectly fit. At Bombas, every item you purchase means you're donating an essential clothing item to someone in need. One comfortable clothing item for you, one donated to someone in need. Bombas, comfort for all. Get 20% off your purchase at bombas.com slash comfy. Welcome to the Tea for the Queen podcast, the podcast where we try to keep our sanity in an era of staying woke. We explore current events and issues and topics through the lens of progressive thought, discussion, feminism, peace, and love, all while keeping wellness at the center of it all. My name is Tierra Burns. I am your host, and this is your episode. Hello, everybody. So we have on with us Miss Michelle Perry. Hello. <laughs> And we have her on because um, we found you on TikTok, is what you know. And we, I had, the, until, geez, it feels like the same year. Until 2020, I did not know that BSL was even a thing. But I was extremely delighted to find out that it is. And Thal and me, we just had the conversation where we said, well, we have to bring her on to talk about her experiences as a child who grew up around BSL. So, yeah. So, Thal, well, do you I'm- Excited to talk about it. Yes. <laughs> so tell tell me a little bit about yourself and tell me a little bit about your family. Um, so born and raised here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, both my parents are deaf. My mother was born deaf. Um, she's the baby out of all of her family, so she spoiled rotten. <laughs> mm-hmm. And my father, he my grandmother had nine children. So three are deaf, three are hard of hearing, and three can hear. So my family's just extremely loud. We do a lot of yelling. (laughs) That's our normal, I guess, decibel of speaking. We're just loud. We're loud and fun. (laughs) That's good. How did you want to? Okay, so I obviously, we just talked about how we found you on TikTok. What motivates you to start Creative Play exactly? So I work with people that have disabilities and I noticed that there was a very big disconnect on young adults, like teenagers entering the work field and what they knew about the working force. So I started making YouTube videos and I found out that I wasn't really that good at editing. So I kind of fell off. And then um, what happened? And then September came around and I'm like, okay. So I started my YouTube videos in the beginning of the pandemic, like March, March, April, made maybe two videos and realized, okay, Michelle, you're talking too much. You're losing your audience. You don't know how to edit. Let's rework this. It's okay. It's okay. So, you know, it was just trial and error. So when September came around, it was Deaf Awareness Month. And I'm like, okay, Michelle, you got to stay relevant. It's Deaf Awareness Month. Let's do something on TikTok because TikTok are one minute videos. Mm. So I'm like, okay, for Deaf Awareness, instead of teaching Deaf students how to do certain things, let's teach the hearing world how to interact with Deaf people. I like So that. that's what I started doing for Deaf Awareness. And it kind of took off in a way that I didn't expect. And so now I'm trying to rework it as opposed to, I want to eventually get 
Gold Board Services up and running, Coda Plug running and um, providing services to young adults, young deaf adults. But in the process of me teaching hearing people all of this deaf education, I'm like, if this is a way for me to fund my dream, because people are really supporting me, and it just fell into my lap. If I can use this platform to educate all, and then any revenue or anything that comes from that, I'm able to plug that into young adults and feed young adults information. Mm. Let's work it. I love that. So where do, you know, where do young deaf adults go now to get support? You know, where do they go to learn how to navigate the world? Um, so what, what the challenges are and then the resources. So the challenges are, it's not deaf people having deaf children. Mm-hmm. It's quite the opposite. It's hearing people having deaf children and not knowing how to communicate with their deaf child Mm -hmm. or not effectively communicating in the home. So Mm -hmm. there's that language barrier in the home. And then as far as resources, we already know that public school can be kind of, I don't want to, are we, can we cuss on your platform? No, explicit. Okay. (laughs) Yes. Okay, cool, cool, cool. I was going to, you know, like both my parents are deaf. I've been cussing since I was probably two. That's cool. So... (laughs) (laughs) but um so you know public school has failed us in so many different ways and so what I'm doing is I work for vocational rehabilitation which is a state agency they help people with disability so your disability disability could be depression autism it could be that you've been in a very bad car accident and you have physical limitations Mm -hmm. um you know, if you're not taking care of your diabetes and you lose a limb or whatever the case may be, you could be eligible for services with vocational rehabilitation. Yeah. Due to my upbringing and my background, I work with the deaf and hard of hearing population. Mm-hmm. So okay. that's a major resource that we have. Yes. Um, and that's in all states. So all over um, the United States, you can find an office in your in your area. That's fantastic. Now, I want to go into BSL specifically. Um, so I, I did some research and I found out that ASL was sign language is the most, well, ASL is like the third most used language in the world. Yes, it is very, very common. And then also, um, so it's BASL. Yes, because BSL, someone went, might think that you're talking about British Sign Language because there's more than 200 yes, sign languages in the world. That. Yes, I found that out. Now, I did see the ASL and I'm like, well, is it BSL or BASL? I don't know. Yeah, no worries, though. We're all learning here. Okay, I'm happy you said that apart. And the funny, the funny thing is that when I was about oh man, eight years old, my mom, she got this like really, really thick textbook for us. She used to give us um book reports to do as children. It was torturous, but <laughs> it paid off. But right. she um, wanted us to learn sign language. It was a sign language book. Even back then, I now like I wish I would have stuck with it because like we were kind of getting good at like trying to figure it out. I don't remember it anymore. But that's beside the point. What I wanted to ask you is what sets apart B A S L today from ASL? Like what are the major differences? I've seen that it's more rhythmic, but what, what are they? So the originally what the difference was, was black ASL started in the South because of segregation. And so when my parents went to school during segregation, they had black instructors. They were not with the white students. The white students had their own separate school. So due to being shut out from main society, you create your own effective way to communicate. And so there are some signs that are different. So for example, um, my mom, she called me, you might've seen this on my TikTok, but she called me one day and she was like, Hey, your aunt told me um, about this sign I completely forgot about Sunday. And I'm like, okay, Sunday, where did that come from? My mom was like, I don't know. Cause typically I'll sign Sunday mm-hmm. with um, like your thumb caressing your, your cheek or your two palms up, like your, I, I don't know, the two palms up church. So Sunday. So those are the two signs that I grew up using. Um, and so Black ASL derived from, segregation. 
Um, so a lot of, but there's so many asset aspects of Black ASL. Say, for example, with Black ASL, it could be more of a bigger signing space. So you could have someone that's signing, hello, my name. But in Black ASL, you'd be like, hey, what's up? And your, your, your arms, your facial expressions, everything is more exaggerated. And that's just how we are as Black people. Even in hearing culture, we do it. So, um, and it's, it's so funny because when it comes to Black ASL, sometimes I can't even put it into words. It's just who I am. It's just something that I've done for so long. And now that people are doing research about it, I'm like, oh, I guess I do do that, huh? Oh, I never thought about that because it's just something that was embedded into me. And now that people are actually doing research and documentaries on it, I'm like, oh, huh, I never thought about that. I just do it. So you mentioned earlier how, you kind of started signing like that. How old were you? Because I remember um, I had to learn, I believe, ASL because my mom was in a car accident and she ended up losing like her, some of her motor skills so she couldn't speak. So okay. me and my like sister, whenever we were younger, we had to learn like a little bit of ASL to be able to communicate with her. That is long and lost, like long. And right. Long. If you don't use it, you lose it. Yeah. She eventually got better. But how old were you whenever you started signing? And was it ASL? Was it BF? B-A-S-L, like? Um, so I was, a, my mom said that she taught me about two. My dad, he, like I said, he came from a big family. So my dad, he did a lot of um, speaking to us, yelling at us, however you want to, you know, categorize it. He was, he was just super loud, but he, my dad used his voice with us. Mm-hmm. So um, as I was getting older, my mom was like, hold on, she's talking to her dad more than she's talking to me. Let me start teaching my baby some sign language. So my mom started at about two years old. Some of her friends were like, go ahead and start teaching her signs like milk and different signs like that, just so she can communicate. My mom would communicate to me wet diaper. Whenever my diaper was wet, I started mimicking to let her know, hey, girl, we got to change this. Oh, wow. I mean, that's that's pretty cool. I mean, wow. So you were pretty much, I guess, would it be considered... Bilingual? Yes. Yeah, so it's actually considered my first language because my mother, you know, taught me as a baby. Right. Wow. But I grew up, you know, learning English, learning how to talk and learning sign language at the same time. So I figured that since you kind of grew up around this environment, have you noticed anything that is like not as accessible with like everyday things? Uh, yeah. It's made like so much easier by simple changes. Yes. Um, my whole life right now when it comes to work is about providing accommodations. So simple things for these masks that are here to protect us and that are not going anywhere causes such difficulty because I didn't realize how much my mom depended on reading people's lips, even though lip reading is hard, but those clues that your lips can give you, or even your facial expressions, um, you know, a simple eyebrow raise or a simple smile, or if somebody's confused, if we're both confused, the different things that your face, your face makes or does to provide those context clues. My mom's, my parents aren't getting. Um, So during this time, a lot of people are taking time during the pandemic to just take a step back, educate themselves on certain things. And I think that learning basic sign language would be just so helpful. And I'm not saying you have to become fluent, but just a couple of words, a couple of phrases just to get by, or even if you work in fast food, I don't know if you saw the TikTok of my dad trying to get his apple pies, honey, but that was a struggle. And just, you know, even numbers just one through 10 could go a long way. Yeah, I can imagine that's very frustrating. I would be frustrated. Yes. Especially if it's like simple, simple things that we could all do. Do you have like any, um, suggestions on how you know if somebody wanted to learn ASL exactly like where they could go or what is the best option or the best way of learning 
Um, yes. Yeah, so there are, oh, let's start off with saying that if you want to learn sign language, I would recommend learning sign language from a deaf person. Mm-hmm. Um, just because a per- the when it comes to a sign language, their grammar structure is different. Their syntax is different. So learning um, sign language from a deaf person is critical. I, myself, I am, my family and I, we are, we're teaching sign language classes now. And so I'm more so of just the support of my mom and my dad navigating the Zoom stuff and marketing, (laughs) but it's, it's deaf instructors teaching sign language. Um, But in regards to some resources there's a website called Sign Savvy where you can type in a word or a phrase. And um, there's like a database that will provide you with how you sign that. And I think even the definition of what that means. So that's one resource. There are some deaf um, TikTokers and content creators that are providing um, phrases such as like, if you're going to a restaurant, how do you welcome yourself? Basic drinks, numbers. If you're in the medical profession, how you, you know, ask someone to call for help, 911, um, just just basic, simple things. But um, I'm trying to think, sign savvy is one. That's That's the number one that I can think of at this time. So are you, do you happen to be involved in any advocacy groups for people who are deaf or hearing impaired? I am not particularly involved in a particular group. Um, Say, for example, if my parents are, my parents pre-COVID were involved in, um, what is it, the National Black Deaf Advocate Group. Um, whenever they would have like functions for the uh, deaf community, my parents would go. There's different. My dad, he did a lot of work with the deaf and blind community. So whenever they would go um, to certain events, I would go. Now that I am older and becoming more intentional with how I'm utilizing my time because I do work multiple jobs, I'm like, okay, now that you're you're being more intentional, now that you're 30 years old and um just more motivated, I guess you could say. Yeah. Um, I am looking into joining some some um, advocacy groups. Okay, good. How is it, so pretty much what you listed is the ones that, you know, we should look out for. Um, so I'm trying to think. I know in North Carolina, there's, I don't want to misspeak. I don't know if they've changed the location of the camp, but there's a deaf I call it the deaf blind camp. That's what I'm familiar with. But in North Carolina is Camp Dogwood. Mm-hmm. And that's where my dad spent a lot of his time um, doing volunteering services. I don't know, just because a lot of brick and mortar places are making changes, I don't know what that looks like pre-COVID. But the one that I am familiar with at this time is the National Black or North Carolina Black Deaf Advocates. There's also um, a national Black Deaf organization as well. So does Black Lives Matter incorporate the deaf community? Do you happen to know? I have some, I have seen some things where it has incorporated the deaf community. Um, A very good friend of mine, and she's also an interpreter. We have um, interpreted a couple of Black Lives Matter, protest and some candlelight visuals here in Charlotte, North Carolina. So yes, I have seen a lot of different um, organizations or different different groups of people incorporate the deaf community more. There's definitely um, a hypervigilance at this time and I'm here for it. Yeah. And Michelle, I want to know, um, what, do you, what did you think about the inauguration someone it was actually there signing what did you think about that moment it was the first time I had seen and it really touched my heart and it was I was excited but I'm gonna spill a little bit of tea right so I was super excited to see a woman of color up there using sign language and 
some of her signs were a bit different. And I'm like, hmm, I wonder where she's from. So going on social media and looking at some of the sign language groups uh, that I'm a part of and deaf community groups that I'm a part of, people were upset that she was signing. They were like, what inspired her to, to be using sign language? Why is she signing wrong? And I'm like, who hasn't said the Pledge of Allegiance 50 million times? We all know when we're, what we all know what she was saying. What's the problem here? Come to find out a lot of the people of the, the wonderful people of um, the white community mm-hmm, mm-hmm. appear to not understand her. Now, I'm not going to say everybody, but there were a good amount of people who were like, what is she saying? Come to find out she's a CODA. So both, her father was deaf. Mm. And her father went to school during segregation oh. in Georgia. Mm. And so some of her signs was black ASL. Mm. I love that. I love it. Personally. I did too, but I was just I like it. the audacity. Y'all, mm. y'all tripping. So it, of course you wouldn't, like I said, I was going to spill some tea because of course you wouldn't know that yes. But being a part of the deaf community and the outrage that so mm. many people had, I'm like, simmer down. What, what? What was wrong? She wasn't one of y'all. See y'all upset. Exactly. And that just shows you privilege, is, you know, white privilege just seeps in everywhere in right. every intersection, every single community, because they felt, how dare you not communicate in a way to make us comfortable? Exactly. Oof, girl. Exactly. <laughs> I was livid. Like I haven't, I was going to create a TikTok, but I couldn't. I couldn't even talk about the topic without saying a cuss word. So I was like, you know what, Michelle, just, you, you're, you're big mad right now. Just, just let it go. The thing I, I really like about Black ASL is it's like a dialect. It is a dialect. It's a, it's like A-A-V-E, except for sign. And exactly. I feel like it's a, it's a very close cultural thing because it's kind of the same thing because not a lot of people were very fond of A-A-V-E in the first place. And now it's a thing. Apparently. Look at us now. Right. <laughs> apparently it's a whole generation. They, yeah, Gen Z language. Okay. <laughs> so do you think that eventually BSL is going to end up going kind of in that direction? Not BSL, my, my son. B-A-S-L. There we go. Is going to end in that direction. In the direction of becoming a Gen Z thing or a... Becoming like... Uh, very popular to the point where people were probably gonna you know say it's their own um i i don't know i don't think so i i i I see people becoming more aware i see people in the deaf community becoming more aware for example um my parents because they were forced to code switch at my mom was what 17 my dad was my mom, my dad, my mom was like 17 when she stopped using her, her black ASL signs, like the, we call it the old school signs. So for my parents' generation, they were felt at that, they were made to feel at that time that their sign language was improper, less than, not as good as. And so my parents and I are having intentional conversations of, Honey, I've been having a code switch since I was five. We just never had an opportunity to talk about it until I became 30. (laughs) The same things that you had to do back then, I had to do as well. And just bringing light on that situation. Um, I'm also a sign language interpreter part time. And I've been having conversations with different people about how a person that may be the majority might provide feedback. Oh, you should sign like this. Mm, you, hey, let's let's take a step back and you know let's be not so quick to correct because it could be black ASL and you're not even aware. Right. Right. I mean, there are some you know like when you work in the education field, if you're a black student with a white sign language interpreter, there that disconnect could very well be there. And I definitely think that's a, a very big cultural thing because the way that, again, English and then the standard sign language is, is very towards white and it's very towards like European type of. Right. 
But I, I don't think that it'll become a, oh, this is mine. But I just I just see so much awareness being brought up that we're, we're all just learning from it. And like I said, growing up, I didn't realize, oh, I did. This is black ASL. I was just doing sign language and I was just being me. And I just realized in certain environments, I kind of had to change a little bit or, hey, this person's not understanding me. Let me think of a different way to rephrase it. Not realizing, oh, this is black ASL. This is white ASL. It was just all sign language to me. So I've noticed after following you on TikTok, (laughs) I've noticed that I've come across, I think, a couple of more I'm going to say kids because they're younger than kids who also do uh, Black ASL. Have you seen something like that around on TikTok? And how, does, how do you feel about that? I have. Um, so there's this one girl. Her name is um, Nakia Smith. I don't know if you her, um her TikTok name is It's Charmé. She's actually deaf and she's fifth generation deaf. So her mom's deaf, her grandmother's deaf, her grandparents are deaf and her great grandparents are deaf. And so um, my family, we get a joy out of watching them on TikTok. I love the content that she brings. She even, she's sassy with it too. Like before she, um, or whenever she's done with her video, she'll put lotion on her aunt, her hands and she's like, exit. And people are like, why do you do that? She's like, okay, well, when you're talking, you get parched and you have to drink water. I have to make sure my hands are moisturized. What's the difference? And I'm like, you better go ahead, girl. <laughs> So she's one person and there's um there's a couple of other people. There's another lady named Raven that I follow. She's deaf and she does a lot of um song interpretation. So you'll find her do a little bit of everything, whether it's Nikki, Cardi B, all types of stuff. And she's awesome to watch. I hope that whenever um concerts are a thing again hopefully we'll see her on the big screen as a interpreter at the concerts that's what I'm hoping I hope that she blows up how oh sorry I was I was just thinking how often are interpreters at concerts I've seen them a lot honestly I I don't go to a lot of I I honestly don't go to a lot of concerts, Mm -hmm. but I have seen I have seen um, videos of the interpreters at concerts providing that accessibility because deaf people do go to concerts. Yeah, deaf people can, um, you know, they can feel the vibrations. They love um, artists just as much as we do. Wow. And they have their accommodations, whether it's the sign language interpreter or their hearing aids or whatever the case may be, they can feel the, the beats of the music as well. One thing I have seen at, um, cause I've been to festivals and seen different interpreters and every single one has like their own different type of flair. And if I'm like watching a rapper, it's usually a, a guy who's interpreting it and he's like doing, you know, all over the song. And I, now I like, now that I think about it, I'm wondering, is he doing BASL? Like, you know, like, that's just my thought. Like, you know, is that possible that they're doing it at that level? Because rap music does use AAVE. So, you know. Right. It, it yeah. could be incorporated into it. Like I said, there's different as- there's different aspects and facets mm-hmm. of Black ASL. Mm-hmm. So, for example, there might be um, like a sign. I was asking my mom because I'm like, hey, ma. Because she she uses the word tripping. She's like, you're tripping. (laughs) And I'm like, okay, do you see other white people use that sign? Because I haven't, not Mm -hmm. in in my working field. I'm usually not using tripping in my (laughs) vocabulary. So I'm like, I wonder, you know, I just wonder. Mm -hmm. And my mom's like, no, I've seen other people use that. And I'm like, oh, okay. Just, I was just curious. So, but there are, you're right. It, there is a VE in music and rap and things of that nature. So I believe there are certain aspects of it that can be incorporated. Yes. Mm, that's really cool. Now you did mention that there are some things that, um, some signs that people should know, like they should just get to know today just to, you know, get help the deaf community out and also to, you know, just 
because you should, I feel like you should know it. Um, yeah. This will be on YouTube. What are some of those signs that we could learn like at this moment to incorporate in our daily lives? Um, some of the signs, I'm trying to make sure I have some signing space. Um, <laughs> um, so my name, mm-hmm. and then you could just finger spell. Okay. So you could, you know, you could like learn your ABCs, which is available online. It's everywhere. So yeah. So my yeah. name, and then I wanted to learn it. So yeah, practice. Practice. Okay. This is practice. Practice. Mm-hmm. Does it matter which hand I use? Because so the the hand that's going to be sitting still is going to mm-hmm. be your not dominant hand. So your dominant hand, whatever hand you write with, is the one that's going to be moving. What if I'm, no, never mind. I'm not going to say that. I was going to say, what if I'm multidextrous, but I'm really not. I'm trying to okay. be. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this is practice. practice. So, um, and hello is the same. Hello. Hello. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you hello. And then my name. Okay. My name. Mm-hmm. 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 And then, um, if you see someone, um. This is need. Okay. Help. Help. Mm-hmm. Because like if you're in a store or somewhere, or okay. you just see anybody, if somebody needs need help. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think. Help. Mm-hmm. What um, if I want to say, can you hear? Like, can you hear me? Like to say to identify if someone is hard of hearing. Oh, well, you could say so, like, yeah, are you deaf? Okay, are you deaf? Mm-hmm. So okay. You deaf. So this is deaf and this is hearing. You know, like our, our mouths are just moving. Okay. Yep, so. <laughs> that was really good. So tell tell the people where they can find you, Michelle. Okay, so you can find me on TikTok, which mm-hmm. is Coda, C-O-D-A underscore plug, P-L-U-G. Mm-hmm. You can also find me on Facebook, Coda, plug no underscore pretty pretty simple and then on instagram you can find me at coda plug asl and you can email me at goal g-o-a-l ford b-o-a-r-d services at gmail.com thank you guys so much for listening to the tea for the queen podcast all of the resources will be in the show notes Remember to check out Michelle at Coda Plug on her website, her email address, and all of the socials. If you have any questions or can't find the information mentioned in this episode, hit us up on Instagram or um, Facebook. It's at T for the Queen. My name is Sierra Burns. I have been your host as well as style today. And we look forward to talking to you next week. Hey Randy, what you doing? Oh hey Dave, I'm just making a list of things that make me feel really, really good. Wearing Bombas socks. Trust me, that's number one on my list. Bomba socks feel so good because we use the smartest design and best materials, making them the most comfortable socks ever. Plus, because socks are the number one most requested clothing item in homeless shelters, we donate a pair for every pair purchased, and that feels pretty good too. To shop Bombas or learn more about how your purchase supports those experiencing homelessness, go to bombas.com slash comfy and get 20% off your first purchase.